This episode of the Stardom Cast is sponsored by Puro TV, your one-stop shop for all your Puro DVD needs. From Stardom to New Japan, from All Japan to Ice Ribbon, as well as incredible box sets documenting the best matches of your favorite Japanese wrestling icons, Puro TV has it covered with new items added every week. And now, as a special gift to listeners of the Stardom Cast, Puro TV are offering 10% off. Simply go to puro-tv.com, use the promo code STARDOMCAST at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Once again, that's the code STARDOMCAST to receive 10% off your entire order. The link to their website is in the podcast description. And now, on with the episode. Hey, this is Kevin Kelly. Get ready for the latest episode of the Starimcast. guys and welcome to the stardom cast your weekly audio source of all things world wondering stardom i'm your host rob goodwin and i'm joined as ever by matt turner matt turner how are you good sir mr rob goodwin i am phenomenal as always always great to talk to you always great doing the podcast and i'm super excited for this week as uh the main event of this show is one of the greatest in my opinion one of the greatest stardom shows I have ever seen, so I'm super excited about that. And uh, last night, little quick, little quick movie review. I went to go see Creed three. So I don't know if you're a fan of the Rocky Balboa uh, series of movies, but I thoroughly enjoyed myself uh, during Creed three last night. I am aware of the story of uh, of Rocky. Unfortunately, it is a blind spot in my uh, in my film fandom. I've only seen the first one. Um, but I know how it sort of all fits together and things like that. But no, I, I don't know. I've never really, never really felt compelled to see the Creed films, even though I've heard nothing but good things about them. Well, if you're going to go into the comic realm with all the movies, as was I do, the main event is Killmonger versus King the Conqueror. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I look at. I'm like, oh, sweet. Like, you know, that's what, whenever I look at a movie, it's just like, they, like when Tom Holland got cast for Spider-Man, I'm like, I have no idea who that is. And whenever I get asked who should play a certain role in a Marvel movie, my go-to is always Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, it should be Arnold. Like, Arnold should play everything just because he's Arnold. But, uh, <laughs> but no, it, it was a uh, thoroughly good movie. If you enjoy the Rocky movies, you'll enjoy this. But uh, I don't want to talk about me. Let's talk about you, brother. You started a – I know we were texting back and forth, as we always do. You started a new job this week. I know you're only a few days in. How's everything going? Well, I've gone back, so, you know, that's always a plus. Um, it, it's gone all right, mate. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's, like I mentioned before, very organizational and admin which is uh, – the sort of nerdy stuff that I love doing. Um, it's very, very relaxed. I've sat in Costa over my lunch um, and things like that, which is quite nice, a freedom I didn't know that I could have. And it's refreshing to, and I was saying this to my girlfriend, as a teacher, you don't realize how much you spend raising your voice. And it's so weird that I just haven't got to do that. Um, and just the quiet, it's... Uh, it's refreshing. Um, I don't know how I'll feel in, you know, six, seven months, but uh, yeah, I feel I feel good. Um, I don't know how the people around me felt in Costa whilst I was watching the uh, Wonder of Stardom Championship match and I'm punching the table as the match is going on. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I think so far all is good in the world, my friend. Well, that's good. And I, I'm really glad that you're happy in your new role and everything is so far, so good. But I guess kind of what I want to know, and I know that a lot of our listeners are going to want to know is, did you tell your new employers that one, you host a stardom podcast and two, that you may need to be taking a three to four hour lunch break so you can watch and review 
the beauty zest hair salon <laughs> Iron Man match between Lady C and Billik and Death. That's that's what we need to know. <laughs> um, it, it, uh, to be honest, I feel like they know that I have I've worked from home today, but I am uh, I'm repping the Stardom Cast hoodie. Um, I feel like you've got to represent. Um, but yeah, it's uh, whether they would let me have four hours to uh, watch varying stardom in showcase shows i don't know maybe i'll uh maybe i'll just book the day off and put that underneath my uh underneath the application <laughs> oh man always fantastic brother but yeah man i'm excited to talk about what we're about to talk about here my friend absolutely got loads to talk about today um obviously we're going to talk about a little bit of news that sort of come up out of these two shows that we're going to talk about today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about stardom in showcase volume four and of course our main event as matt was mentioning earlier our main event is going to be the triangle derby uh championship battle the finals of that tournament which considering if if you were looking at this show in January, you would be forgiven for thinking, especially with its proximity to uh, the Yokohama Arena show, you would be forgiven for thinking this is a throwaway show. But far from that, Stardom stacked the deck with it. Um, probably one of the most stacked cards Stardom have produced and all of the matches delivered, which honestly was fantastic. There was no real let up from maybe the second match on the main card all the way through to the main event. I thought everything flowed really well. We had a match of the year candidate. Um, and we have our first triangle derby winners. And can I say, Matt, it's been the greatest triangle derby of all time. And folks, if you have your Stardom Cast bingo card out, that was the free square. There's <laughs> one of us, i.e. mentioning the uh, the best triangle. Derby. Yeah, you know, again, it was, uh, it was a good to a very good tournament. There were some matches that hit great. There was nothing that hit excellent. And maybe we've just been so spoiled on just, uh, you know, between how good the last two Cinderella tournaments were and how good the 2021 and the 2022 five-star was, is that there's just been, again, I think it's just, we've just been so spoiled. But again, there was, you know, by no means was this a bad tournament. It was just good to very good. And then we got these last three matches, especially, and obviously we'll get into it, especially the wrinkle and halfway through the show where it's like, yeah, we're going to make the main event even more important. And God bless Suzu Suzuki for really just, you know, stepping up. I'm like, oh, now I know why this is going on last. So, uh, you know, kudos, kudos to the booking because the booking was, was great here. It was. Um, I wasn't sure when um, when I first, because I went into this show, the uh, tournament finals, um, I went into this show, I didn't know who won um, the Hazuki and Sayakamatani match. And that was the match I wanted to remain unspoiled, uh, which I managed. I knew who won the tournament um, completely by accident. Um, and I knew who won the Red Bell match because it was a case of, I'm sorry, my Yuki isn't winning. So it was that. And obviously I didn't know the high speed championship match either. Um, but I thought originally I was like, really? You're having this team win the final? Really? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Oh, I see. And then everything that came out after the main event happened and you're like ah we're getting that okay i'll let you off then stardom um and then of course we had all these announcements we've had the new um full card for new blood premium we've had a fantastic further wrinkle in the wakasuki arma tam nakano cosmic angel storyline we've had announcements of guest appearances at all star grand queendom jesus christ what a time to be a stardom fan um but first matt Let's talk a little Safe. bit about the Stardom Cast Extra and what is coming up on our Patreon this week. Oh, on the Patreon, on this past Monday, I released the uh, alternate commentary of Momo Watanabe challenging Io Shirai for the second time for the World of Stardom Championship. And uh, this next Monday coming up, Momo Watanabe versus Mayu Iwatani as um, March Momo Watanabe Madness is in full swing here. That's the match that uh, I'm going to be doing commentary on. And again, I'm going to be doing this uh, solo, just like how I did last week, just because, again, Rob starting the new job. Don't want to overwhelm him, so he asked me if I can do it, you know, just single, absolutely not a problem. So uh, 
Yeah, so that's what's going to be coming up on Monday. Uh, Momo versus Mayu from the 2008 Five Star Grand Prix. And it's a match I've never seen before. So I don't know who wins. I'm assuming it's a really good match because it is Momo versus Mayu. So I'm going to go into this completely blind. Uh, and I'm super excited to watch it. Um, probably at this time next week, give or take a day or two, the uh, the first um, of the uh, of the uh, Momo Watanabe um white belt tier patreons will be released and that's the 2021 momo Watanabe five star grand prix run through and uh what i did on this one too i only have one match to go and that's momo versus sherry the finals which i've probably seen five or six times but i'm just going to rewatch it and then i'll probably be recording this weekend so what i did is since every single one of these matches took place in the year 2021 I went back to the good book, Rob, and you might be saying, <laughs> what good book is that? Folks, get out your bingo card. That is uh, Living the Dream, Stardom's 10th Anniversary in Review by one Mr. Rob Goodwin. And what I did is I went and I watched all the matches up again up until um, the, uh, the, the finals, and uh, I wrote down what my star rating was, and then I wrote Rob Goodwin, and then I kind of just put an underline. And then once I watched everything, because I know the fi- the rating that you gave, you know, the final. Uh, and I went back just to see how our ratings would pair up. And there's like a good majority, like 80, 85%. And if we're not spot on, we're only off like a quarter star. So I was just like, wow, we're really on the same wave- wavelength here. So uh, I thought that was kind of a little, little cool thing I'll do. And then when I go and do the review, like I said, I'll probably record this in a day or two. Um, I'll mention my fi- my rating and your rating as well. And then at the end of the month, also, we're going to be doing the, uh, again, to wrap up Momo, March Madness, the 2018, her 2018 Cinderella um, uh, win. So uh, that's that's pretty much where we're going with the Patreon. And speaking of the Cinderella tournament is finally the English brackets are announced. So uh, if you are a Patreon member or if you're thinking about becoming a Patreon member, you can for just $1.00 you can enter our Cinderella tournament bracket, which will probably be up on the Patreon maybe this weekend, Rob. What do you, I don't want to put too much pressure on you. Think this weekend, I think probably by Sunday. So you're listening to this. If you're a patron, you're listening to this on Thursday. If you're uh, on the free feed, you're listening to it on Friday. It should, he says, should be up on Sunday by about, Ooh, shall we say midday, my time. So what's that? Seven o'clock your time, Matt. Yeah, there you go. Give or take. Give or take, folks. Uh, so, and again, what that is, is if you're already a Patreon, it doesn't matter if you're the $1 tier, the $3 tier, the $5 tier, you get to uh, enter our contest for the Cinderella tournament. What it is, is if you get the overall winner right, you get a sticker and an autographed business card for me. If you get the uh, the finals right and the overall winner right, you get the same thing, plus any item off our merchandise store. Or if you want one of uh, Rob's books or one of Rob's upcoming books, you know, just let me know and I'll work something out. If you get all four semifinalists right, the finals right, and the overall winner right, not only do you get the previous two uh, prizes I mentioned, but you also get a sketch of any stardom wrestler you want from my daughter lily uh again if you're not a patreon member it's only a dollar you can get all that stuff just for a dollar so um and speaking of the merchandise site as well another thing that poor rob i'm putting on him is uh this friday for the weekend sale only is going to be the uh the new stardom cast logo the with uh kairi eo and mayu the freedom and that'll be on sale friday until sunday a weekend sale only and then it goes into the vault until we open it back up for our new patreon members our special patreon members for the new patreon we are launching in may so needless to say we're almost as busy as the actual uh promotion that is stardom <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't have it any other way brother would we wouldn't have it any other way um let's kick in to some news then just before we talk about anything else and the big thing that has come out today and Matt, you made a very good point that news like this usually breaks just after we've recorded. So it's nice to actually be able to uh, talk about this today. Um, but the We Are Stardom Twitter account released a tweet that says, Kyrie says she will take part in All Star Grand Queendom, the April 23rd show at Yokohama Arena. She says she is bringing someone with her that will shake things up in Stardom. Will she unveil who it is at Stardom's April 2nd show at Karakawan Hall? Um, so, first things first, K, 
Kairi announced for the big show at Yokohama Arena. Great, but I don't think that's a massive surprise. You would hope that a big attraction like Kairi would be on that card. We already sort of know that Mercedes Monet is going to be on that card as well. I know what everyone is going to want, which of course is the same thing you want, Matt. <laughs> yes, I'll let, I'll let you finish. I'll let you finish, and I'm going to leave everybody in a chant. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> um, I know what everyone thinks it's going to be. Um, obviously, the April 2nd show at Corican is the same day as the second night of WrestleMania. Um, at the moment, um, and this is a little bit more news, Io Shirai has been announced for a WrestleMania match. She's taking a place in a six-woman tag with uh, Dakota Kai and Bailey against the team of Becky Lynch, Lita, and Trish Stratus. So there's no way she's going to be at the April 2nd show. If it is Io Shirai, which, you know, I'd said that Mercedes Monet wasn't going to come out of Wrestle Kingdom and there she came, just a walking down the ramp. Um, she could potentially produce a video um, to sort there of there it is. at Corrigan. There it is. My man. <laughs> I don't see it. Obviously, the other options are, you know, looking at WWE, you're looking at someone like... Um, like a Mako Satomura, who has just um, failed in her attempt at the NXT Women's Championship against uh, Roxy Perez, um, or Asuka. I don't see it being Asuka because, in my humble opinion, I think she takes the uh, the red the red belt from Bianca Belair. That's who she's taking on. Couldn't think who she was. You just, uh, said, the, up you with just said the red. You, you just said the red belt. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I I said it. Good for you. <laughs> We're starting. We're a stardom podcast. We're going to stay hard with, with our loyalty towards stardom. Good for you, buddy. <laughs> Honestly, I started saying it. I was like, nah, I'm just going to lean into it. Steer, steer into the skid. Um, so I don't see them letting Asuka um, near stardom. So if it was to be from WWE, it's going to be EO or Mako. Um, I personally don't think it's going to be EO Shirai. I think she's too featured on uh, on programming for it to be EO. I think it would be incredible, especially as you are trying to fail or trying to do good numbers at the Yokohama Arena. It would be amazing if they could have Io Shirai's first match in Japan since, what, 2017? It would be incredible. 18. 18, sorry. I think it would be incredible. I am sceptical as to whether it will happen, but I think that's my Britishness coming out. In me, I did put on Twitter earlier today that knowing... Oh, look, it will simply be Fukuk and Death dressed as Smee from Peter Pan and accompanying Pirate Kyrie. But I digress. Matt, I know who you want it to be. Lead the chat. So, uh, obviously, it's always great to uh, get... Uh, I got. I, I found this out in a DM from our good friend Darren Chan. Always good hearing good news from him first thing in the morning. And uh, I, you know, I'm going to... I already put it out there on Twitter. I put it out in the DM that I talked to him about. Let's say it, folks. EO, EO, EO. <laughs> and here's the, and you may be saying, well, Matt, what are your sources? That's going to be EO Shirai. It's the best source ever. It is my very positive and childlike brain that it's going to be EO Shirai. Um, Darren's, uh, Darren's birthday is actually on uh, April 2nd. So the fact that Kyrie is making an announcement to make her announcement of who it's going to be. <laughs> she's so she's double hyping. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's Kyrie. Who cares? She can do what she wants. Uh, you know, it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a possibility. Uh, and that's one thing Darren said too, is, um, you know, he probably wrestling on WrestleMania either on the first or the second. So she probably won't be there, but they done the video walls with Chris Jericho. You know what I mean? They can easily do a video package. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm holding on hope that it is Io Shirai. But to be honest with you, it could be anybody, and I really could care less. It could be Hornswoggle. No disrespect to Hornswoggle, who I've been on a handful of shows with and is an absolute gem of a human being. The fact that we're getting Kyrie on this show, which we figured we would, it's Kyrie. So um, uh, so it's it, it's going to be a bonus regardless. Now, you wonder if it's going to be like a tag match, because um, you're, you're kind of looking at the card and the rumor card, and you're wondering who – is it going to fill out? Like, who who is Kyrie going to match up with? Again, I thought, you know, going into uh, the pay-per-view, I thought it would be Kyrie versus Saya. That's obviously not happening. But uh, Kyrie has unfinished business with Utami. So maybe I'm thinking it's Kyrie and this person versus Utami and Izumi. So I was also thinking that maybe it is Mako Satomaro since they did have the greatest tag match in the history of stardom <laughs> against Thunder Rock. 
Um, but the kind of the rumor that's been kind of bubbling up a little bit the last two hours on the Twitter that kind of makes sense is there's a big free agent in the Joshi world, and by the name of one, I'm probably going to butcher the name, and you will correct me, sir. One Sori Anu. So, and I know she has some previous history with Kyrie, so that's a possibility. And the fact that her uh, her and Kyrie teaming up to go against Utami and Azumi on this big show, I'm all for it. Absolutely, and. <laughs> This is no disrespect to Ciara Anu at all. Is she that big name? That's The way they've done this, the way they've built this, you've got an announcement on April 2nd in order to try and shift more tickets. I just feel like they've sort of shown their cards, let's say. It's, it's a big announcement. I think... If it is someone from WWE, I mean, we haven't even, you know, talked about the possibility of it being someone from AEW, but I just, I don't think it is. Um, if it is someone from WWE, it, they're not going to come out all guns blazing, much as we'd love them to, um, because they're still under contract from another company. So the chances are it will be a tag match so that they can be somewhat protected, come in for a hot spot and then go back out. Very similar to uh, Rio in the tag league a couple of years ago, where it was very, very obvious that she was explicitly told by AEW that she couldn't do much. Um, but if it's someone like Neo, just her mere presence... I imagine would do huge numbers for stardom with her being in many people's eyes, the greatest red belt champion of all time. Um, let's think positively. I mean, Matt, you, you introduce every <laughs> Patreon episode as a positive. We are a positive podcast. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go on a limb and say, do you know what? Sod it. It's going to be Io Shirai. Yeah, um, my man, we got him. We got him, the most negative person on this show. No offense, you're up against me. It's fine. Yeah, we got him, <laughs> folks. There it is. We got him. We got We got him. All right. There, there he is, folks. Rob's in, all in on EO. There you go. Now, what do you think the match is going to be if it is EO? Um, I imagine they will probably be Kyrie and EO versus uh, Super Strong Starter Machine and Super <laughs> Strong Giant Starter Machine. I mean, they. Folks, he, he literally just 180 this podcast in a matter <laughs> of 40 seconds. The brilliance of Rob Goodwin. <laughs> the Grim Reapers versus Kyrie and EO Shirai. Book it, Rossi. I don't care. I'll take it. I don't care. I'll take it. <laughs> um, in, all, in all honesty, I mean, who have you got left? If you look at who. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it by saying the announced matches for uh, the All-Star Dream Cinderella just yet. All-Star Dream Cinderella. All-Star Grand Queendom. Um, but Mayu is probably going to be taken out of that. Julie is going to be taken out of that. Sai Kamatani is going to be taken out of that. So who has got stuff to do? I am 100% going for the High Speed Championship, having changed hands by then. So could it be Azumi and Utami? I mean, Utami's not doing anything at the moment. Um, it would make sense. Maybe, you know, depending on who it is, it could be Kairi and her partner against Nene Takashi and you for the tag belts. Um, Ooh. Because me and you were very adamant that it should have been my Himi versus 7-Up at that show. Um, they've announced that it's going to be 7-Up versus uh, BMI 2000 at Corrigan on the 10th of March, so we know that that's not going to be the match uh, for the Yokohama show. So, you put in... You have a look at the tag division. You're either going Meltier, which it can't be, and we obviously know why that is. I don't know why I'm... T if you're listening to this podcast, I'm hoping you know the results to the show. So, we... Okay. But we're going to stop listening halfway through. Like, hold on, i got to go back and watch the pay-per-view. <laughs> yeah, pause it and watch the pay-per-view here. Um, come back to us afterwards, though, please. Um, but it's not going to be Tam, because Tam's in the main event. It's not going to be Mayu, because Mayu's taking on Mercedes Monet. It's not going to be Saya, because Saya is going to be taking on Mina Shirokawa. So uh, the only other people that I could think that they would put in against um, Nene Takahashi and you is FWC. Oh, because I was just thinking about that as you were just talking. I'm like, who, who's left? It won't be my Hemi. But yeah, you have the uh, the FWC. And obviously, after what Hazuki did this past week, and I think she's going to have a very prominent match on this show. Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered, and we're all here for them, sir. But I mean, this card's already looking great. But if we do get the uh, 
I mean, I just think that the, with Kyrie, I think there's obviously the unfinished business with you, Tommy, from their draw um, from at the end of last year. So, um, you know, maybe you kind of, you know, re, you know, you get that going a little bit here, considering the fact it's such a big show. But there's literally like 10 options they can go to and nine, nine and a half of them are like the right option. Like, you know, outside again of you doing them up against the, you know, the Grim Reapers. But again, I mean, that's your pick. So if that does happen, <laughs> you know, every, we, we all wrap good with a beer, folks. So, uh, yeah, I mean, really starting with just the way the booking and the way the roster is and the fact this is such a big show and the fact that uh, the people that are in charge over at uh, Titan Towers there in Stanford, Connecticut, are a little bit more open to uh, opening the doors to have certain talents coming in and out. Um, really, the timing of the show is just kind of perfect. So, Let's keep our fingers crossed that we are going to be getting maybe an EO, uh, an Asuka, or a Mako. But, yeah, the fact that Kyrie has made an announcement for her announcement, yeah, you're right. They kind of pigeonhole themselves that this kind of has to be, you know, a name that is known not just in Japan but worldwide. And I think, you know, I proved my negativity to be uh, – to just be wrong when I uh, when I downplayed the links to mercedes Monet. So do you know what? I'm figuring if I'm positive about it, it's going to happen. So, uh yeah, we'll talk a lot about, you mentioned Hazuki. We're obviously going to talk a lot about Hazuki, who in my mind just has been rocketed up that card. And I think Stardom have got a bit of a problem when it comes to Hazuki. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that when we get into what was an absolutely outstanding pay-per-view. But before we get into that, the New Blood Premium card uh, for the 25th of March that is going to be from Yokohama Budokan has been announced in its entirety. And obviously, two very, very important things are happening here. We have got uh, Wakasuki Armour's final chance to win a match or she's gone from Cosmic Angels that took two very very big twists which we're going to talk about very very shortly and of course we are going to be crowning our first New Blood Tag Team Champions now before we get into the card uh, Matt they've released images of the official New Blood Tag Team Championships. If you haven't seen them yet, uh, we did tweet them out, so they're on our Twitter page, and you should be able to find them pretty much everywhere else as well. Um, what was your first thought when you saw these belts? Obviously, we know they are incredibly different to uh, everything else on the Stardom roster, but you know these are very much a developmental title. Do you think they fit the mold? Do you like the design? They're very bright. They're very in your face. Do they fit the New Blood brand? I think so, but there's no actual blood on them. So I missed the opportunity. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I think they look good. Uh, I think, uh, again, this is kind of like, yeah, you're right. They're de developmental territory. Uh, again, I think we kind of have an idea where the finals are going to be. But considering the fact that uh, we completely did not get the finals right at all for the, <laughs> the Triangle Derby show, um, I think regardless of any one of the, the four teams that are in it that win it, um, it'll be in it to win it. Look at me. Go, Nigel McGuinness. Um, I think that'll be... Uh, I think it'll be a, a you know a good way for them to start. But as far as the belts go, sir, no, I like the design. I think they look very well, very good. Yeah, they are. Um, they're a lot better than the uh, the mock up they released in uh, December, which they made very very sure that everyone knew was just a mock up because everyone saw it went ah because they were fairly fairly bland. But anyway, this card, um. We are going to have a three-way tag match to open Hanan and Hina taking on Momokogo and Saida taking on Rina and Ruaka. We're going to have the debut of the three rookies that were introduced at Corican on the 17th of February. Um, and they are as follows. Hazuki is going to be taking on Minamini Komomo. Uh, we have got Maihimi taking on the team of Lady C and Hanako. Hanako. Hanako, let's go with Hanako, um, who is the 181 centimeter trainee, so the really tall one. So I like how they are instantly putting her with Lady C. Um, and then we've got uh, Aya Sakura getting her wish and taking on Julia in singles competition elsewhere on the card. We have got Miyu Amasaki in her, it's some sort of a trial series, but in her fifth match, she is going to be taking on Suri in singles action. We've then got the two semi-finals for the new Blood Tag Team titles. So uh, semi-final one 
is going to be Mirai and Tomoka and Naba taking on uh, Amisori and Nanami. And then in the other semi-final, we've got Starlight Kid and Karma taking on Chanyota and May Sakurai. Obviously, the final will then be on this show as well. Now, you'll notice that I haven't mentioned the Waka Sukiyama match, and there is a reason for that. We're going to go through the results of Stardom in Showcase Volume 4 in a moment, but one of the main things to come out of that show was after the Captain's Fall match between Tam and Tam's team and Waka's team, um, Tam said that she was going to team with Waka Sukiyama in this sh- or on this show. So it's not going to be a singles match between Waka and Nene. It's going to be a tag team match. Tam Nakano called out Nene and told her to bring her best partner. Now, Matt, we were, <laughs> we were adamant that it was just going to be you because that's who she's tag champ with. But no, Nene Takahashi decided to raise the stakes significantly and bring in Kairi of all people. So the tag match is set now for... The 25th of March, Yokohama Budokan, it is going to be Wakasukiyama and Tam Nakano taking on Kairi and Nene Takahashi. Seven Kairi are back together. Now, that in itself is already an interesting wrinkle, but then add to the fact that at the press conference where they announced the full cards, Wakasukiyama then went one further and said that if she loses this match... Not only is it her last match in Cosmic Angels, it's her last match in Stardom. Now, I don't know about you, Matt, but this is the thing. I mean, I'm excited about the new Blood Tag titles. It's a new belt. I'm happy. But this is what I'm tuning into this show for. I mean, I don't know where they're going with it. I have a th- I've got what I'd, sort of what I'd like to happen. But Jesus, like, where are they going from here? Because this match has got so much intrigue and they've done so well booking this entire Wacker angle, especially, and I keep coming back to this, especially as me and you thought the bloom had fallen off the rose significantly and they'd sort of let the storyline dry out beyond repair with Wacker just eating loss after loss after loss after loss, but they managed to reignite it tenfold. And especially now that crowds are cheering again, We've said before that there is very, very few people on this roster, if anyone, that is as over with the crowd as Wakasuki Armor at the moment. There's a lot of different angles to go here. I'll get the first and probably, no, it's going to be two negative things I'm going to say while I'm on this show. Is the one thing that I am still bitter about and will never get over is hopefully Kyrie and Tam have more than five minutes in the ring together. <laughs> anyway, uh, so. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Nene Takashi, since she's been back, I mean, you both agree she has over exceeded everything. But where, in, uh, in in my opinion, maybe you'll back me up on this too, where she's being the most out of is her stuff with Waka, especially crowd reactions, whether it's a clap crowd or non-clap crowd. I mean, that match that they had with a lollipop versus 7-Up and Corkin, they were exploding when Waka was in the figure four with Nene. I mean, remember, remember that just insane reaction from the crowd mm. at Corkin? Yeah, absolutely. so you have that. You have that. We all assuming that Waka's going to get the win here, and then it's like once they introduce Kyrie, I'm like, well, maybe not. But then she's going to leave Stardom. She's a real hot commodity, uh, and the booking's been just fantastic. So you don't think she's leaving Stardom? I don't think Kyrie's eating a fall here because she hasn't taken it's the first loss for her in Japan on a Stardom show since 2017. Is not going to come from Waka. Is it? But at the same time, if she loses to Waka, what does Kyrie lose? Nothing. She's a made person. She's a star. She's fantastic. She's one of the best wrestlers in the world. And that just makes Waka just so much better. What does Waka beat Nene Takahashi? And then does that maybe have going into what you put out here a few minutes ago? Does that lead into like a Kyrie versus Nene Takahashi thing going into uh, the Yokohama show for the tag belts? That's a possibility they go with. Oh, by the way, Tam's there. So it's like, holy jeez. It's like, yeah, exactly. Like, where are we going here? I don't know, um, but I'm so excited to tune in. But I just hope they don't do a time limit draw. That's all I'm going to say. It's like we built this all up. I'm like, no, time limit draw. See ya. It would be, it, it would feel a little bit like a coward's way out. But I wouldn't hate it. Like, ordinarily, I hate time limit draws as a booking crutch. Um, I feel like I've made that fairly obvious in uh, in our time podcasting together, but I feel here it wouldn't be the worst thing. What I would love to see happen 
and I know this isn't going to happen, but what I would love to see happen is for Wacker to not take the fall, say Tam gets pinned by Kyrie. So Wacker loses the match, but doesn't get pinned. Oh my God, imagine the heartbreak. And then she turns on Cosmic Angels and somehow, you know, there's a workaround that she just joins a different faction or something. She I joins the X. Absolutely. Comes out green, <laughs> suck it. You know, she's throwing crotch chops, pedigree to Tam. <laughs> Um, she's sweet chin music and people down the corridor. See, I just oh, sweet kick Stan. Um, oh, you didn't know? <laughs> I would love that to happen just because it adds even more drama to it. Um, the DX thing or the. Uh, I think a little bit of both. A little bit of both. I mean, they, <laughs> they do have that out of Tam pinning Nene or Tam pinning Kyrie as opposed to Wacker. I don't know whether that's a little bit of a cop-out or whether Wacker has to be the person to take, to take or to get the pinfall. Like, they haven't been explicit about that, which makes me think that there is some sort of workaround. Again, I would love Tam to have inserted herself into this match as effectively Wacker's insurance policy, and she be the one to cost Wacker. Like, it, ju- it just feels like a full circle story. And then we've got this molten feud between Wacker and Tam. And, you know, th- obviously, Wacker is going to be insanely over, even more so after that. I'm, it's one of those where I'm so glad I can't see what's happening because the intrigue in what is going on with Wacker Sukiyama. With Wakasuki armor match, someone who hasn't won a match on the main roster has eaten God knows how many falls, and she is one of the most compelling things on the entire roster. And we're building a show around <laughs> Waka. So, and do you know what? My next question to you is Yokohama Budokan. That is where they're holding this show, and then the following night they're holding the uh, Cinderella tournament first round. Does this, based on the card that I've just read to you, does this have enough on it to draw a big number at Yokohama Budokan for you? What uh, what are you trying to throw out as a big number? Like, what's the under over? And then I'll I'll I'll, I'll go from I'll go from the barometer. Right. Well, Yokohama Budokan, I believe, is a three thousand seat venue. I believe, but I think. From what I remember, Stardom usually get around fifteen hundred. But okay, so fifteen hundred is the barometer. Now I didn't realize, and I should have, that this is the same weekend as the Cinderella tournament. Where is the Cinderella? Is the Cinderella in the same venue? Back to back days, same venue. Okay, so you're gonna get you're gonna have very few people that are going to just go to one and not the other. You're going to figure you get the most bang for your buck. You get to see Kyrie. You get to see the new trainees. You get to see, you know, the first crowning of a champion on this new blood show. So I think based on the fact you brought Kyrie in, based on you have this amazing storyline, Nene Takahashi is still a really, really good wrestler and a pretty good draw. And then you have this absolutely loaded first round of the Cinderella tournament with 84 matches that are all look terrific. I think that you are going to get, um, if Stardom usually draws around 1,500 here, I'm going to say you get 1,700 on this show. You think they're getting 1,700 on this New Blood show? I think so. I wow. think so, because what, what's, what, what's your prediction? Well, I've just had a look. I think the last time they ran the Yokohama Budokan um, was the Triangle Derby opening round. And they drew 1,600. They drew 1,605. And that's an unusually high number. And we were surprised that Stardom managed to do that with the card that they had. So maybe you're right. Maybe I'm just being a little bit pessimistic. Um, you know, Maybe they have a ticket. Maybe just like WrestleMania uh, they've done for the last few years since they've been doing back-to-back, where it's like, say, for example, I'm just using, for example, it's $50 a night. But if you get the same ticket, it's $80. And maybe they're doing something like that where it's like, hey, if you buy single day tickets, it's this much, but we'll knock off 10, 15, 20 bucks, depending where your seats are, if you get back to back nights. And that might be an intrigue for for uh, for people 
people to get, you know, to go, go to the show back to back nights. It would make sense. That's a really, really, really good point. And again, I'm not crapping on this card because again, I've, I am so intrigued by this main event. And again, we haven't even talked about the new blood tag team champions and we will preview this card as, uh, as the show comes a little bit nearer. Um, but Mirai and Tomoka and Arba versus Amasori and Nanami is going to be great. That's going to slap. And then you've got Starlight Kid and Karma against Chanyo and May. That's going to be good. And then the final, which I think both of us <gasps> predict is going to be Mirai and Inaba versus Starlight and Karma. Short of the Karma shenanigans, I think that could be a really, really, really good match. I think it could be a really well, good match. Considering the fact that me and you both predicted that's the final, folks, take all your chips and bet the opposite. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We've said that's the final, so uh, be ready for a uh, Amisori and Nanami versus May Sakurai and Chanyo to final. Um, I'd be, I'd be very pleasantly surprised if they get over sixteen hundred for this card. Um, just because it's a new blood card, not because I think it's a terrible card. I don't think it's a terrible card. I think it's doing what new blood is. It's the entire thing is set up to expose the new talent. You know, there's no Mayu on this card. There's no Kogama on this card. Um, there's no Tekla on this card. There's no, um, I'm trying to think of someone else who isn't on this card. There's quite a lot of, there's no very little Oeditai, no Momo Watanabe, no Saki Kashima. There's only Starlight Kid, I think, and Ruwaka and Rina. So they're focusing very, I, I do like the uh, confidence to stick with right we're focusing mainly on younger talent you've got all three rookies on there you've got a may a Miyu Amasaki singles match you've got the new blood tag titles with people like Nanami in there Tomoka Inaba Chan Yota so I do really respect the fact that they aren't just going right it's the Yokohama Budokan so we're going to put a red belt tile defense a white belt tile defense you know basically make it a pay-per-view just with some new blood things right at the bottom but I'm really intrigued now to see what this brand, the New Blood brand, can bring into a venue like the Yokohama Budokan. Very, very, I very intrigued. That, I think there's two things you're missing, sir. Number one, uh, Julia's on the card, regardless if she's wrestling a rookie. Julia True. is a very big draw. Uh, two, this isn't just a New Blood card, sir. It's New Blood Premium. And I think <laughs> that if you're like, if you're on the fence of buying the ticket and like, wait a minute, this is New Blood Premium. Here's my credit card, sir. <laughs> Yeah, they obviously do still have... I mean, Shuri's on this card, okay? But there's no... I don't think there's any of the big three of Queen's Quest. No, there's no Yutami, no Saya, no Azumi. So, you know, what I'm saying is they have they haven't sort of panicked and put the entire main roster on this card. So, do you know what? Fair play to them. No Natsupoy either, I've just realised. Um. Anyway, that's enough previewing. Let's talk a little bit about the two shows we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk a little bit about Stardom in Showcase. We're going to sort of go through the results. There's a couple of things we want to talk about coming out of that show and sort of a couple of things I want to talk put to Matt. And then we're going to obviously spend the majority of our time talking about what was an absolutely outstanding end to the Triangle Derby. Um, but Stardom in Showcase Volume 4 came Thursday the 20th. So Thursday the 23rd? What am I on about? Sunday the 26th of February 2023 from Kobe International Exhibition Hall in Kobe, Japan, in front of 702 people. Now, obviously, there isn't a huge metric for that attendance to see sort of how good that is. However, uh, Stardom in Showcase 1 drew 845, Showcase 2 759, and Kawasaki Showcase 3 drew 778. So it is down from the first three, and it's significantly down from the first one. Do you think, Matt, in all honesty, relevant of your positivity, do you think there is a place in the Stardom calendar for these shows? Because Once the cord... Go Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was say, I apologize. Uh, once a quarter, free on YouTube. I feel like, yeah. I mean, this show didn't come out on Stardom World for bloody ages, so you know you saw that. But you saw sort of expecting something from this show, and you know I am very aware that they are an acquired taste. <laughs> the Stardom in Showcase shows. You know, it's a chance for the the ladies to cut loose and sort of 
try different things. And that's fine. Don't mind that at all. Some of it hits, some of it doesn't. Um, but I don't really think they can be asking people to pay. I haven't seen anything on these Stardom and Showcase shows that justifies having to pay separately to watch them. And I'm, I'm, I know you feel the same about that. Yeah. I mean, if, if they would have maybe dropped the price to like, like years ago when I first started getting the WWF pay-per-views, the main ones, like your SummerSlam Royal Rumbles, they were like 20 or $25. The in-your-houses were like 15 They're like 5 or $10 cheaper. If they would have dropped this to like $10, Fifteen dollars. I would. I can see myself getting it. Plus, we're all about waving the Stardom flag and supporting the brand. But like when these Stardom showcase, the one, two, and three were like forty dollars. I was like, yeah, hard pass. Like, hard, like I understand these girls. They, they, you know, they worked their tails off. Mayu literally went down about eighteen flights of stairs and got hit by a bicycle in the same match. But I get it's Mayu, so uh, that's kind of her deal. I was just going to say uh, you could say that, and it would it. <laughs> No, you'd have to explicitly explain to people that that was actually part of the match and not just Mayu being Mayu. <laughs> That's true. Another story for another day, brother. But uh, yeah, you know, the, again, you're right. I mean, this thing, I mean, usually takes, you know, anywhere between two to four days for these shows to come up on Stardom World. But yeah, I mean, we mentioned last week, this show came out a handful of days before we were recorded the last podcast. And we're like, we have no, we're not going to be able to do a review because the show's not up yet. This thing took like five or six days. But um, obviously they have the capability because all the new blood shows have been streamed live on YouTube. And again, they're fun. They're funny. They're it's it's not stardom proper. Again, we you know we said before it's basically stardom in the quantum verse uh, for your Marvel <laughs> fans. Um, again, maybe once every three or four months streamed live on YouTube. If they really want to do a uh, make it as a pay per view, I wouldn't charge any more than ten dollars for it. To be honest, no. I mean, if you. We did say that actually this one, ironically, was probably a little more story based than the than the last couple. Um you've got the six woman uh, captain's fall match between Cosmic Angels and Club Venus. You've got um the UWF rules match, not necessarily story driven, but I do like the idea of Suri and Saku Kashima. Um that three way nine woman tag match, that was sort of the main event. But then similarly you had Grim Reapers versus the strong machines or the super strong starter machine team um and you got some sort of pro wrestling pose down which i know you've got uh you've got some thoughts on and then of course you got that hardcore match you know on paper donna del mondo's hardcore match julia immiger and Maiga versus prominence like you think oh my god prominence in their hardcore wheelhouse you know himica said that one of the things she wanted to do before she retired from pro wrestling was to have this hardcore match with Risa Sarah. You look at that on paper and think, God, okay, maybe they're sort of beginning to streamline these stardom and showcase shows. And unfortunately they didn't really, but uh, we'll, we'll go into the results now. So match one was a woman's pro wrestling decisive number one muscles battle. Try saying that five times fast uh, with Chan Yota defeating Sayurida 2-1. Chan Yota won the arm wrestling uh, Sayurida won the wrestling match via the Idabashi in 5 minutes and 13 seconds and Chan Yota uh, won the pose down uh, we'll go back through these in a moment I'm just going to sort of whip through the results first match 2, 4 way falls count anywhere match Azumi defeated Hanan, Momoka Hanazano and Natsu Sumire, uh, with Azumi pinning Hanan with the diving double foot stomp in 16 minutes and 32 seconds. In the six-woman captain's fall match, the Cosmic Angels team of Tam Nakano, who was captain, Natsupo and Saki, defeated Wakasukiyama, who was captain, and Club Venus, Mina Shirakawa and Mariah May, with Tam pinning Waka with the violet screwdriver in 13 minutes and 14 seconds. Um, match four, six-woman tag team match, the Grim Reapers, who we still don't know Know who they are um defeated the team of super strong stardom machine super strong stardom giant machine and the debuting super strong stardom big machine with uh, a reverse splash in 11 minutes and 56 seconds uh we had the hardcore match the aforementioned hardcore match with donna del mondo's team of julia himika and Mika taking on the prominence team of risa sarah suzu suzuki and haragi karumi that ended in a no contest in 12 minutes and 32 seconds. Good Lord, do I have some things to say about that. Match 6, UWF rules match. Suri defeated Saki Kashima with a high kick, which um, made her lose her fifth point, so it's technically via a TKO, in 9 minutes and 23 seconds. And match 7, 
Your main event for the show was a three-way nine-woman tag team elimination match. The stars team of Mayu Iwatani, Kogama, and Ozuki defeated the Uedatai team of Natsukatora, Starlight Kid, and Momo Watanabe, and the Queen's Quest team of Yutami Hayashita, Saya Kamatani, and Miyu Amasaki, with Hazuki getting the pin over Saya with the Frankensteiner in 13 minutes and 56 seconds. So one positive, definitely, to come from that main event was even more elevation of that feud between Hazuki and Saya Kamatani. And I love the way that Hazuki, leading up to that pay-per-view, really did seem to have Saya Kamatani's number. And I did love the fact that not only did she pin Saya here, but she pinned Saya with one of her own moves and proved that I can pin you, and I can pin you in a variety of ways. So don't think this is a foregone conclusion at the pay-per-view. Really, really, really like that, Matt. Um, not only that, not only that, but they uh, just to piggyback off what you said. Not only that, but that uh, Frankenstein and her Karana, they played so well into their story into the match. And I'm going to apologize now because once we get to that match, it's like I'm going to go off on like a 10 to 15 minute love letter on that match. I think you will as well. But uh, yes, I think that was brilliant how they absolutely played all. They played that finish into the uh, the finish of the match, which we'll talk about here later. Now, Matt. You yes. have a bit of an issue with this opening bout, I believe. The uh, pro wrestling decisive number one muscles bout. Yes, I already got my first negative thing out of there. Is, uh, I took a little <laughs> jab at hopefully Kyrie and Tam get more than uh, five and a half minutes in their match. I'm taking a little jab at the uh, the Tokyo Dome match from either the year, this year. This is the second and only negative thing that I will be uh, uh, negative about on this show. Um now, one of the many, many, many things I love about pro wrestling is you can uh, make it magic, you can make it smoke and mirrors, you can make pro wrestling whatever you want. Now, the uh, obviously, if Saeed and Chan, Lo- Chan Yoda had a shoe arm wrestling match, I don't know who would win, but I'm assuming that part was worked, right? Whatever it is, what it is. The match that they had, it only went a little over five minutes, I thought was fantastic. Now you get to the super pose down. You cannot smoke and mirrors a super pose down don't get me wrong chan yoda is in phenomenal shape she has huge arms she's in great shape saida completely blows her out of the water on the super pose down for somebody who has seen the movie pumping iron at least two dozen times if you haven't seen i think it's free on youtube it's fantastic uh somebody who has friends that have done bodybuilding competitions before and somebody that really respects bodybuilders they do this super pose down. And Chan Yoda's arms and legs are probably bigger than Saida's. But one, Sai, if anybody's ever seen a, a super pose down or an actual like muscle posing contest on like a top tier level, is like you have to tan. Saida clearly comes in really tan here and she knows her poses. Like she knows how to do the poses. She's got more uh, muscularity. Does my wife sit down and watch with me uh, stardom? Maybe. 30 35 percent and that's kind of highballing it but she did watch the first three matches of, of the show and even she was just like because i was she's like well saida clearly wins this and i'm like i could have sworn that i saw the results and that chan yoda won and she's like there's no way there's no way that saida's clear and again i'm not downplaying chan yoda she's in phenomenal shape saida was just caught in great shape again tan knew how to do the pose and then chan yoda won and i was like even my, and again, I kind of, you know, I looked over at Amber and this was the most head scratching she's ever been watching a stardom show other than the Meltair entrance, which again is another story <laughs> for another day. I don't know how, like, again, you can smoke and mirror who wins and losses. That's what's great about pro wrestling. But am I nuts here, Rob? Like, to me, this wasn't even close. The Super Pose Down was clearly won by Saida. In a comparison between the two, I don't feel like it's it's even a competition. Um, however, obviously, I don't want to alarm you, Matt, and uh, I certainly hope this doesn't come as a shock to you, but wrestling is predetermined. Um, How dare you, sir? <laughs> How dare you, sir? <laughs> you know for a fact that this was just put on to, uh, to showcase Chan Yota, which is, which is fine, um, but yeah, I feel like if this was a shoot competition, Sayurida would have won quite handily, um, but you know they're trying to uh, they're trying to showcase Chan Yota, so I'm not going to begrudge them that. But yes, when uh, when Sayurida is turning around and showing you her back, and it's literally her muscles have muscles, um, it's you know it's difficult to see how Chan Yota walks away with the victory. But there we are. My big thing of this match of this show, Matt, is go ahead. 
how? How? <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Honestly, <laughs> I, I, I've I'm watched this. <laughs> oh, excuse me, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. How? Oh, my God. Right, seriously. So, the Donna Del Mondo versus Prominence hardcore match. It was a hardcore match. Ended in a no contest. How? How? How does a hardcore match where literally they were hitting each other with kendo sticks, they were dropping each other on Lego, they were using chairs, they were dropping each other on chairs with forks in them. They were, ru- but because Tekla got involved, they threw the and match out. Sakurai. I, I, no, I think te- so, I think Tekla. One of them got involved first. May and then Sakurai I kept going. Did, an, did a bloody elbow <laughs> drop off the top rope, which made everything worse. Um, <laughs> May Sakurai has improved massively. Still hate the elbow drop. Um, so here and Julia did that, and then Tekla got on the other side, and it was absolutely fine while Prominence are beating her up with a kendo stick. But the, then they seem to just have a brawl in the middle, and the rest are yeah, bad enough, guys, and throws it out. That's so bad. If like. Again, it's kind. It's quantum. Ver- like, who are we trying to protect here? Again, it's quantum verse uh, <laughs> stardom here. So the fact that it's like five on three, and I get it. Like, prominence is your. They're your champions, and obviously they they win the tournament here coming up. You know, a week later, which, which we're gonna review. But it wouldn't really been so bad if it's a five on three match that they lost. Even like Julia schoolboy Haragi into the Legos. Like, is anybody gonna remember this? No offense. I, I gave the match three and three fourth stars. It was a really good match. Everybody worked hard. But yeah, like, really, you're going to have a disqualification in a hardcore match? I'm with you on that one, brother. There's literally a moment where Karumi hits the nowhere driver on Micah onto two steel chairs. The referee looks at it and doesn't throw it out because it is a hardcore match, otherwise known as anything goes. But apparently the most hardcore thing in the hardcore match is using a tackler. So there you go. Um, I, that I, was the most dangerous method in stardom. <laughs> it's just, I, I do not understand. Like, I feel like I am more offended by this result than, than anything else. Like, I mean, Himika is literally going away in a month. Does she lose anything by taking a pinfall against the team who do hardcore in their own hardcore promotion? Again, the champs, too. The, the, the champs, champs. The who champs. are going to be winning the tournament in a week. Like, I, I just... And, and I'm not even going to get into the fact that the entire, the entire premise of a hardcore match is that anything goes... So the referee should not. The referee should literally be there to counter pinfall. That's it. Why he's doing anything else, I've got no idea. He must have just got bored. That's my only thing. Like I, I just do not understand that, and it proper threw me for a loop. So I'm watching it, and you're right. Like there are some proper nasty bumps. Um. Like all of that plastic stuff that was in the ring that they were dropping each other on repeatedly looked really, really painful. The forks actually got stuck in the back of Je- uh, Julia's legs in the chair, so that looked painful. And then that bastard driver that I talked about before that looked nasty. So there was there was legitimately good stuff in this match. It's just the result made no sense at all in in, in the context of this or in the context of what a hardcore match is. And then. Himika and Risa Sarah have like a little face off because Himika wanted to do a hardcore match with Risa Sarah before she retired. And Risa Sarah says, Yeah, you can you can retire happy. And I was like, Can she? Can she though, Risa? Can she? Anyway, it, it doesn't really matter because ultimately it was it was a pretty forgettable match. Horrible as that sounds. Um but it just I wouldn't have minded if just one of the teams had won. I'd have given it an extra three quarters of a star because the match itself was good. But the finish just did not make any bloody sense, man. Yeah, one or three things I'm going to say here, and then we'll move on to way much more positive stuff because Absolutely. we're going to be beaming with positivity in a minute. Is one, yeah, when you have a hardcore match and there's a DQ, the heat goes on the ref. You're, like, if, if we're in the crowd and say Prominence are, the, are supposed to be the heels and DDM are supposed to be the baby faces, and me and Rob are loaded off our ass, which we probably would be in a show like this, and we're like clearly cheering on DDM and then, you know, we're heating on 
uh, Suzu, Risa, and Haragi, and the ref throws the match out, we're not going to get pissed at Promise. We're going to get pissed at the ref because they threw a match out and a hardcore match. So if you wanted to get out of this without beating any of these six ladies, I- I'm kind of just spitball here and throwing off the top of my head. You could have done one or two things. You could have just pinned Techler May Sakurai. I think it's a better decision. <laughs> really, anything goes, right? I think that's a better decision than throwing the match out. Or if you're going to throw the match out, they have a wild brawl all over this arena. They brawl all the way to the back. You wait 20 or 30 seconds, and the ref's just like, okay, they're not coming back. The match is over. I think those two are better options than just be like, yeah, Tekla's the most dangerous weapon in all of stardom, so uh, exactly. you can't use her. You know, I don't know. It was a, it was a bizarre, it was a bizarre match. Um, but my final thing is, Matt, and I, this isn't negative or positive. Where did the big inflatable cow come from? I don't know, but my my uh, literally my my second note in the uh, my first note in the second match was they literally throw Rossi into an inflatable cow, and it's just it's it's so weird that my wife watched three matches in the last six <laughs> months in Stardom, and it was the superposed on which again she was just like, what the heck? How does I? And I enjoyed the the match, and the match was good, and so did she. And then I was like, I can't believe out of all the great matches Stardom, she hasn't didn't watch you know any of the Kyrie stuff. She didn't watch Kyrie versus Mercedes Monet. She didn't watch Sherry versus Julia. Um, you know, any of these matches, but she's watching Rossi Ogawa, the old, you know, as she calls him the Monopoly man, thrown into a, an inflatable cow by Azumi, who's supposed to be one of the biggest baby faces in the company. She's like, this is, she goes, you really have, I said, I have to review this. She's like, what's your star rating? None. I'm like, I have to review this for the show. She's like, you're very loyal. You're very, very loyal to your listeners. Like, damn right. Um, to answer straight. your question, I have, I have no idea, but I think they've had an inflatable something in every, every stardom and showcase. So maybe that's like, kind of like the gimmick. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's something to do with Kobe. I think he can get Kobe beef. Maybe, maybe it's something to do with that. Who knows? Ooh, look at you. Look at the smartest guy in the room, folks. Right there. There you go. Um, I will just say, by the way, that the four way was pretty decent. If you're going to go and watch any matches off this card, go and check out the four way. That was pretty good. As was the, uh, the nine woman tag match. Um, oh, of course, that was a Kobe beef match. That'll be what it's mm-hmm. from. Yeah, there oh, I th- you I th- go. You knew that. I thought you knew that. Look at you. You're, you're even smarter when you're not being smart, Rob. That's there how we smart go. you are. <laughs> anyway, that's enough talking about cows and bizarre finishes because we're going to talk about what will inevitably be in the running for show of the year at the end of the year. At the moment, it's got a rating on cage match of 9.1, which is astonishing, really. But we're talking about the Triangle Derby 1 Championship Battle, the pay-per-view from the Saturday, 4th of March, 2023, from Yoyogi National Stadium, second gymnasium in Tokyo, in front of 1,019 people. So just to give you a sort of... Uh, a comparative data for that it's the second time stardom have run the venue outdrawing tokyo super wars which was the first show we ever reviewed together matt which i thought was nice um from november 2021 which drew 1119 now it looks like it's roughly capacity um pre-pandemic was between 3500 and 4000 um this show championship battle is the second largest attendance at the venue post pandemic now i could give you 485 guesses matt and you would not be able to tell me what promotion has the largest post pandemic attendance at this venue would you like to know who real quick can you just re uh what was the number again on this 1919 Okay, I thought you said 1,019, and I was like, oh, I thought it was closer to 2,000. That could be me. Uh, Okay, the promotion that has the most uh, attendance in this venue post-pandemic, if you're telling me it's going to be something that I won't guess, I'm going to say Ice Ribbon? It's not Ice Ribbon, but of all promotions, it's Tradition. Um, What is that? I've never even heard of that. Tradition is, it's a promotion. Is it Fujinami's promotion? It might be Fujinami's promotion where basically it's like legends. It's a mixture of dragon and tradition, and it's sort of like a um like a legends promotion. Um but they outdrew it with around two thousand one hundred people for their show in twenty twenty two. And it was main evented, get this, by Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Tatsumi Fujinami. Fujinami's in his sixties. Like that's pretty good bloody going, if you ask me. Well, we know where the great mood is going to be wrestling back in the end of this year. <laughs> <laughs> where he's having his 78th retirement Shut show. 
Shut up, Matt. Oh my goodness. Um, but yes, we had uh, pre-show matches. Um, these were streamed for free on YouTube. They're still on Stardom's YouTube channel as of now. But we opened with a three-way match. Rina defeating Miyu Amasaki and Rina with the jackknife bomb in five minutes and 53 seconds, Matt. Not a great deal to say about this. It was a shade under six minutes. I thought Rina continued to look good. Um, I think she is the real breakout of this sort of generation of superstars, with the exception of Hannon. I feel like Rina is hot on her tails, not just in respect to her in-ring work, but also her character. I feel like she's the most charismatic, and I've, I've flown this flag for a long time but i feel like especially in the last couple of months she's really upped that and you look at how she was interacting during the cinderella tournament press conference um sort of bad mouthing mariah may which was really funny if you haven't seen it go and check it out it is really funny um but i do think that rena is sort of the next big thing here and i know that we're running this match back at corican as uh, a number one contendership match for uh, the future of stardom championship but it would not surprise me if rena wins that because i think sooner rather than later we are going to have rena with that belt around her waist matt yeah absolutely um I, again this me you looked really good here she's continued to impress the uh the past few months as she's kind of been start stop start stop and i'm really excited to see this trial series of matches that she's doing probably up against all the killers of stardom. Uh, again, Rena and Hina, they are sisters, so their chemistry is excellent together. But yeah, I, I agree. Rena is, she's really on hot, hot on Hana's tails. I mean, if you take a look, I think Hana's the better wrestler. Rena has the better character. Rena's two mentors are Momo and Starlight Kid, where Hanan's two mentors are Mayu and Hanan. So almost like, uh, or not Hanan, uh, Hazuki. And uh, almost kind of like, she's on her tails, but... You know what I'm going to say, Rob? You know where Hannah has the big advantage on Rena, right? <laughs> <laughs> Put that in your bingo card. <laughs> Go on, mate. What is it? Go on. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> the theme music. <laughs> the theme music is an absolute banger. Um, I gave it three stars. It's It was a good opener, but, you know, just under six minutes, a bit of an exhibition match. But I do agree with you. I do think that, obviously, Mia was disrupted by that injury, sort of right in the middle. Um, of this run, but I feel like the more she's in ring and the more she's in with the likes of Suri, who she's got a new blood premium, she's going to, she's only going to get better, isn't she? So, yeah, uh, three and a quarter stars. So I was right there with you, buddy. The second and last show on the pre match, uh, pre show was a tag team match the Queen's Quest team of Utami Hayashishta and Lady C defeating rebel enemy team of Ramkai Chow and Mike Ozaki, with Utami getting the pin on Ozaki with the German suplex in seven minutes and 25 seconds. Talking about people who've improved, Lady C is right up there, man. I don't just mean because she's tall. Oh, that was good. Look at you, buddy. You're on a roll today. That's oh. this new job, sir. This new job serving you well. So, <laughs> so I, I had, I, before we recorded, I had three things I wanted to go over at Rob. He's like, yeah, done. Yeah, working on it. Yeah, anything else? I'm like, no, man, I'm good. Uh, so, <laughs> so Rob's on a roll here, folks. He must be sleeping well. But uh, yeah, Lady C, again, I know a lot of people want her to go to uh, DDM, and I, I can kind of see it. But I think, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Queen's Quest. Not sure if anybody knows that. But I think she does a great job being kind of the understudy to, uh, you know, the big three in Utami, Sai, and Izumi. And I thought this match was really good here. Uh, the one negative, no Holy Demon Army finish. Uh, but that's A-OK. I still thought the match was really good. I thought the I thought the double teamwork from both teams was really good. And then we see Utami getting the win with the, uh, the German suplex. I thought Utami and Micah especially had really good chemistry. I've been... Pretty impressed with... Uh, sorry, I was eating an orange at the same time. Um, I thought Mike Rozaki's done pretty well when she's had the tap on the shoulder, and I thought she did well again here. Um, I think when you're in a team with Mayuki and Ram Kai Chow, it's, it's very difficult to get noticed. But I think she's done really well. She's very different to those two in the fact that she's a powerhouse, and I thought her and Utami complemented each other very, very well. Um, I gave this three and a quarter, Matt. I was the same way with you, sir. Three and a quarter stars. And real quick, uh, upset about the Holy Demon Army finish. Um, there's a show that we didn't get a match. We didn't get a chance to review because it went up late on Stardom World. But it was like an eight or ten person D uh, yeah, uh, DDM uh, tag match. And uh, the Holy Demon Army finish was done by Julia and uh, Himika. 
So maybe that's part of her uh, retirement tour. She gets to do the Holy Demon Army finish. So We can but hope. We can but hope. <laughs> um, and we know it's who it's going to get done on because the next stop on the uh, the Himika retirement <laughs> road is, uh, bless her, Nat Sapoy. Um, <laughs> we kick in to the main show then with a six-woman tag team match. Donna Del Mondo team of Micah Tekla and May Sakurai defeating the Club Venus team of Mina Shirakawa and Mariah May and... Wakasuki armor with uh, May Sakurai breaking out the guillotine somersault leg drop in 10 minutes and 20 seconds. This was a pretty fun opener, Matt. Yeah, it sure was. And what I keep forgetting to bring up, and I don't realize until after we get done recording, I'm like, ah, I forgot to bring it up. So I literally circled it and I put, bring this up here. Have you noticed the last five or six matches that Mina's been in? She's been doing the Arisha Hoshinki uh, pop up turnbuckle kick. And uh, if you don't know what that is, obviously, I know you're a huge fan of Arisa and you, you know her moveset pretty well. It's like if you're in the turnbuckle, like if you have your hands on the turnbuckle and your feet are on the ground, you pop up with your feet on the turnbuckle and then you t- basically twist your hips and do an insiguri to the uh, to the person's head. I've noticed Mean has been adopting that a lot since she's been back from injury, which, again, if you're going to uh, – like Jake Roberts always says, if you're going to steal your stuff, steal it off the grate. So um, I don't know if she's been meaning to do that or or she obviously it's in her arsenal now. But I don't know if she realizes she's stealing from Arissa. But hey, man, good on her. But good on her. But yes, this was a really, really good opener. Really fun opener. What I noticed, I, I hadn't noticed that about Mina, if I'm being perfectly honest. But obviously Mina's adopting in this new Venus persona um she seems to be adopting a lot more of a strike heavy offense so it makes sense because a lot of Arissa's kicks and things like that connected very well so if Mina's going to take a style it does make sense to be Arissa the thing I noticed here was a how how people reacted to Mariah May people seem to really like Mariah May um and Waka seemed to be even though there wasn't necessarily enjoyment in her face let's say she did seem to be happier with uh, Club Venus than she did when she was with Cosmic Angels a couple of weeks ago. So I thought that yeah. was quite telling. Now, obviously, this was... Um, I actually watched this before I watched um, Stardom in Showcase. So it's sort of a case of... I, at this point, I didn't know the Wacker was leaving Stardom, is what I mean. So... I was like, oh, she's she, she's definitely going to Club Venus. Now, obviously, I don't know. But I thought that was quite telling here, that she seemed a lot more relaxed in the company of Mina and Mariah May than she did with Cosmic Angels, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. And there was a match, too, that either she wasn't – her either she was seconding Mina in a match that had Tamman or vice versa. I know Tam was in the match, and I think Mina was in the match. Or, no, excuse me, it was Tam, it was Tam Poi and Waka, and Mina was seconding – you know, basically, you know, uh, on the outside. And when Waka came to the ring first, because she runs the ring like the Ultimate Warrior, why we get the phenomenal Meltier dance, uh, Cosmic Angels dance. But when Waka got in the ring, Mina gave her a big hug. And then Mina saw that Tam got in the ring, and it was like, oh, no, I kind of got caught with the smoking gun. Obviously, it was done on purpose. So, again, it's just all these little, little things that they're doing on this Waka story that is just stretching it out to, again, make it one of the best stories in stardom in the last two years. And, folks, if you're new to this podcast, me and Rob like a lot of the stories that stardom has been doing the last two years. But, uh, yeah, it was another nice wrinkle in this Waka story. And then, obviously, you know, aside from – Wakazuki Yama, who was very much the focus, and Mina, who uh, was a focus as well. I thought Mariah May and Tekla had really good chemistry, and Mika and Mina Shirakawa, again, had really, really, really good chemistry. Um, spoiler, we know that Mina is obviously going to have a very big match in uh, in Yokohama. Do you think she's improved enough to be classed as a top-tier champion, Matt? Mina? Yeah. Oh, and we're going to get into it once we uh, once we talk about the uh, the Wonder of Stardom Championship match. I really don't know. She was so close. She had such a great – and I've been singing Mina Shirakawa's praises on this show for about a year now just because we've been seeing the video of her – the videos that she's been putting on social media, her putting in the work at the uh, MMA gyms and in the ring and whatnot. And uh, she went into the five-star with a lot of steam, came out with a lot of steam, and had that fantastic match with Saya um, for the Wonder of Stardom Championship. I know a lot of people look at it, you know, uh, because of the ending of the match, but you take that out, and it's one of, if not Mina's greatest performances 
But I don't know. Obviously, she's going into this big show, the biggest show in the history of stardom, and she's contending for the second biggest belt in this company against the longest reigning, as far as success, uh, the defense goes, um, you know, champion, and in my opinion, the greatest wonder of stardom champion. So is she going to be the one to end, you know, the biggest winning streak in the history of this championship belt? I don't, I, re- oh, she's so close. I'm going to say yes, but I, again, again, we'll get, we'll get into more of it later. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really interesting what they're doing with Mina, but yeah, uh, just to piggyback on what you said, Mina and Micah, you know, give me, if Mina does win the white belt, I hopefully, I hopefully one of her first challenges is Micah, because that's a match I would like to see get like 14, 15 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I feel like the company are very high on Mina. So we'll talk about that when we get to. I was just intrigued, especially after uh, a performance here, which was which was very good. Um, I gave it three and a quarter, Matt. What did you give it? Three and a half, good sir. Um, after this, we got our typical stardom sort of schedule update with the Golden Week Fight Tour 2023 being announced, which is otherwise known as when me and Matt are the bloody busiest. Um, and that is as follows um we have got the 29th of april in aichi the nagoya international conference center event hall um hiroshima the day after in the 30th of april fukuyama industrial exchange center big rose uh yamaguchi in the 3rd of may in kaiko mess shimo naseki um we've then got the fukuoka goddess legend show which is going to be on the 4th of may from the fukuoka international center uh kumamoto uh, on the 5th of May in the Kumamoto Castle Hall Civic Arena. And then we close off on the 6th of May in Kagoshima at the Nene Lease Sakurajima Arena. Yep, nailed it. Um, and I believe there is a bonus show as well that will be taking place on the 9th of May from the Edion Arena Osaka. Um, those translations are courtesy of our good friend Karen Peterson over at Post Wrestling because, of course, with this being a pay-per-view, none of the translations were up and none of the subtitles were up. So all of our translations um, and all of the stuff that we've been able to translate from Japanese to English is all courtesy of um Karen, so go and check her out. Um, we moved on then to match four, a 10 woman tag team match. The Ueda tag team of Natsukatora, Momo Watanabe, Saki Kashima, Ruaka, and Fukikin Death, defeating the stars team of Mayu Iwatani, Kagama Han, and Sai Ida, and Momo Kogo with Fukikin Death getting the pinfall over Momo Kogo with the O'Connor roll in eight minutes and 32 seconds. Um, this is my one real nitpicky negative about this show. And it's not a massive negative by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, ultimately, if you've seen one Oweta Tai versus Stars match, you've seen every Oweta Tai versus Stars match. There's very little in this that's any different. But what they do, they do well. Um, my one little nitpick is you have got the next or the number one contender, effectively, to the high speed championship in this match. Why is it not her that's getting the pinfall? It it just makes sense. I mean, Fuki and Death's been doing less and less dates with the company. Um, so it doesn't really make sense for her to get the pin. Obviously, it's a multi-woman, and you always need there to keep is. your eye on Fuki and Death during a multi-woman, obviously. Um, but I just feel like you could have just heated up Saki Kashima a little bit ahead of her inevitable high-speed challenge. I mean, again, it's a small nitpick. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to shower this pay-per-view with negativity just because of this um, but otherwise it was fine yeah uh, i you know if you remember rab when we uh preview this and try to do the predictions we're like maybe mayu gets the win because she's going up against uh, mercedes monet or you give it to hana or you give it to saki and you you even said before we moved on to the next match we're probably just really overthinking this and overbooking it and then once fucking death had the roll up on momo kogo and i'm like what a bunch of idiots we are yep I think I I think it's a non-written clause in, in her contract with Stardom that if it's a multi-person match that she gets the win. So I think that's I think you literally answered your own question. It's a multi-person match. You know, I see your point. Like, why wouldn't you give the win to Saki Kashima or Mayu? But ultimately, for how good the rest of the show is from what we're about to talk about next and to the end, like you almost forget that like uh, <laughs> that Momo Watanabe and Mayu Iwatani, two of the best wrestlers in the history of this company, were in this match because. Uh, the rest of the show is really good. Again, to answer your question, it's a multi-person match. Uh, Fukin Death always has to get the O'Connor roll roll up win. So, 
three and a quarter stars. <laughs> yeah, I gave it three stars. I feel like this was probably just solely there to make sure that everyone got on the card. There, there wasn't much storyline progression or anything like that. None of the competitors have really got stories going on with each other, but they did what they do best. And uh, yeah, it came out really well, apart from uh, my little tiny nitpick. Um, I gave it three stars. I can't remember if I said. Match yes, did. five then, <laughs> and this is where the show really, really ticked up in quality. Match five, the first triangle derby semi-final with Aberembo God's Eye defeating Cosmic Angels with Shuri submitting Natsupoy with the White Tiger in 11 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, Shuri and Natsupoy did a lot of the heavy lifting here, and N- Natsupoy especially, and... There's very few people in this company who can take a beating like Natsupoy can. I think if they were to really invest in Natsupoy as a singles competitor, like she'd get over huge because she's such a good seller. You really did feel, and obviously when Shuri kicks you, I imagine it does bloody hurt, but the way she sells everything just is so good. It just looks really, really convincing. And that's something I love in my wrestling. And I don't feel like Natsupoy gets enough props for that because she does spend 90% of her time in stardom being absolutely bludgeoned by anyone she's put in the ring with. Um, But I thought her and Suri, especially as the relationship they had before um, Natsupoy left for Cosmic Angels, I feel like that came to fruition really well here. There was a beautiful moment where, and it really did make me laugh, where um, Suri had just bludgeoned Natsupoy, had gone for the pin, and rather than just break it up properly, uh, Tam got into the ring, then ran back, and then hit the violet shooting. And you could just see Natsupoy like, why did you not just break it up? And Tam's like, yeah, but it looked cool, didn't it? Um, so that really made me laugh. But otherwise, I feel like these six women did really, really well. I did keep an eye out because you've been singing the praises of Saki and how much she's improved since, you know, probably the five star. Um, I did keep an eye out here. And you're right, she does compliment Natsupoy and Tam really, really well. Um, I don't think either of us are surprised that Aberembo God's Eye were winning this, especially if Cosmic Angels beat Aberembo um, on the final night of the blocks at Corican. So ultimately, the right result, really, really good chemistry, major props to Natsupoy. I gave it three and a half, Matt. Yeah, um, I liked it way more than you. I had it four and a quarter, actually. Wow. Um, I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed their match in the block final, and I was like, I hopefully it's just as good. And I think I gave that one four, four and a quarter as well. But yeah, I will completely agree with you that nobody takes a beating like Natsupoy. And what complements that is nobody really gives a beating much better than Shuri. Uh, but uh, I really liked her. And, and Natsupoy really, you know, th- she threw it back here. She really threw it back at Shuri. And there was one spot as they're building towards the finish where uh, the Cosmic Angels hit a triple super kick on Shuri. And Shuri sells it like she's out on her feet. And Natsupoy quickly follows up uh, with the German suplex, which got a really good near fall. Um yeah, you had some really good uh, teamwork, you know, three-way teamwork stuff from all three Cosmic Angels. And like I've said before, uh, and you just said, Saki does a great job complimenting Tam and Natsupoy. And again, it was really, really good here. I liked how anytime that like Sherry or Mirai was in like really good control, you would just see a quick melt here, double team that would shift the advantage back to Cosmic Angels. I really liked that story. Uh, and I really enjoyed the, the finish here as well. Uh, Mirai and Ami Sawyer was really good. They had like a, almost like a mini tag match with melt here. You'd see some really good stuff with Saki and Mirai and Saki and Shiri as well. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, I think once, obviously all the focus is on the Yokohama Budokan super duper double looper with sprinkles on top show. But I think once that show is over, regard, now I think everybody expects Julia to have a long uh, run with the red belt, but regardless, whoever is going to be holding the white belt, whether it's, you know, my theory on Hazuki, which I'll get into, uh, whether it's Sai or whether it's Mina, I think that's a point can almost be put into like the Micah spot where it's like you can put her in a main event or semi-main event of any pay-per-view from now leading into the five star, either challenging Julia for the red belt or challenging anybody for the white belt. And it's going to be good. It's going to draw money. Um, and it's going to up Natsupoy's, uh, Natsupoy's stock. Not sure really what they're doing with Meltier. 
I think the smart money would be to kind of put them back together and well, they're not like they're apart, but basically ha- give them another proper run with the goddess of stardom belts. Again, I don't know why they took them off. Um, you know, we've talked about that at nausea on the show before. But yeah. I totally agree with you. I think that, uh, you know, going into the, the uh, late spring, early summer, I think it's a time to really start pushing not to put up to the upper echelon uh, of the wrestlers in stardom. And again, I absolutely love this match four and a quarter stars. We move on then to the other semi-final to see you. Abarembo Godzai will be taking on the final with prominence, defeating 7-Up with the Grand Maestro de Tequila, which uh, is the name, the fantastic name given to Suzu Suzuki's roll-up, which performed on Yuna Mizumori in 10 minutes and 36 seconds. Say what you want about 7-Up, and we have <laughs> on uh, on multiple occasions. What you can't deny is that their matches have been really, really good. And I feel like this match between 7-Up and Prominence summed up exactly what they're all about. Heavy hitting, throwing people around, the stuff between Karumi and you, and then Karumi and Nene all looked really, really good. And what they did here was they highlighted the two women in these two teams that don't really get the the accolades, especially in prominence. Everyone is drawn to Suzu Suzuki, and rightly so. She's incredible. And unfortunately, to a little bit of a lesser extent, uh, Risa Sarah. But no one really talks about Karumi. And here I felt she was given a lot of time to show what she's all about. And the same with Yuna Mizumori. I feel like she was given a lot of time here, and I felt like both women did tremendously well. When you've got people who can carry a match in the way that Nene Takahashi can carry a match, that Suzu can carry a match at 21 years old, that Risa Sara can carry a match, you know, sometimes you can default to letting them do their thing, but I thought they did really well in giving those women the spotlight, and I thought both those women need credit for how well they ran with the ball, um, Karumi especially, who I've grown to really like during this uh, during this Triangle Derby, and she's probably one of my one of my top five competitors, because I think not only has she improved, but she offers something a little bit different to Suzu and Risa, and yeah, Overall, I enjoyed this massively. I gave it three and three quarter stars. Yeah, even Haragi threw like the Joshi style dropkick, that flat back dropkick. I thought was, I mean, we've been basically seeing her almost be like a tank. Uh, and very much like how uh, I'm a big fan of how Saki's been complimenting Tam and Natsupoy as like the third person in, in uh, the Cosmic Angels tri- trio. Haragi's done very well with that with uh, Suzu and Risa Sarah. And, uh, you know, when they first did the opening graphic of the this show, and we weren't sure what was going to main event. We, I mean, I was leaning a little bit more towards the red belt would be the main event, and you pretty much thought it would be the finals of the Triangle Derby. And when they said that that was going to be the finals, like, okay, you know, Rob was right. And then halfway through the match, I was like, wait, we're going to be getting God's Eye versus 7-Up, because that's what we thought was going to be the final. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. We're going to be getting another you versus Mirai, probably non-sell job. I'm like, or not less, maybe that's what the whole story is building up to. And then, uh, you know, I was kind of, I'm not going to lie, Rob, I was a little bit worried. I'm like, this is going to be a great show. Does the main event get ruined because of the lack of selling we've been seeing you do, especially with Mariah and Ami Sori? Or again, maybe that's the whole build and it's just a story that I, I don't see. And then you kind of, and I, I, I noticed when they do these multi-person stardom matches that when you kind of get towards, as they're building towards the end, there's only two people that are really, two wrestlers that are legal in the ring. You rarely see anybody kind of tagging out uh, like you would in like an AEW trios tag match or anything like that. So when you see Suzu and Yuna kind of going back and forth, and I was like, wow, they're really going to have Yuna beat Suzu? I'm like, well, okay, that's a you know good feather in the cap. And then out of nowhere, she hits uh, the tequila roll, and I was like, oh, didn't see that coming. All right, fantastic. We're going to get God's Eye versus Prominence main event. I'm all in. And then uh, Suzu, I, I, I had this one a little bit better than you, four stars. Suzu grabs the microphone and uh, ups the ante on this one, doesn't she? She does indeed. Um, basically calls out God's Eye and says, right, well, let's make this for all the marbles. Um, let's make this for not only the first ever Triangle Derby winners, but we're also, seeing as we're already the artist of Stardom Champions, we'll make this the final and an artist of Stardom Championship match. And it's something that Stardom have done before in the Goddess of Stardom Tag League. I believe Thunder Rock 
were the champions and they sort of made the final a uh, championship match. And I believe Seven Kyrie did it as well the year before. So it's something that isn't new in Stardom, but it was certainly something that upped the stakes somewhat in that main event. Um, and it did give me a sense that, okay, God's eye, you're definitely winning this. And obviously, I was completely wrong, but uh, I enjoyed that little tidbit as well. I did think when Prominence won, I was like, I wonder if they'll make it a title match as well with them already being champions, and sure enough, they did. Um, we'll move on then to a singles match with Chihiro Hashimoto defeating Himika with the ankle lock in 8 minutes and 52 seconds. My only complaint about this match is that we didn't get more of it because these two started like a bloody house on fire. They threw everything at each other. For Chihiro Hashimoto to literally deadlift Himika into a powerbomb is honestly an incredible sight to see if you haven't seen it. It really is. Plus, I will die on the hill that says Chihiro Hashimoto has the best entrance gear on this pay-per-view. Okay, it's effectively the Cookie Monster, and I'm all here for it, Matt. Wow, wow, wow. Tommy off guard there. I mean, really, Hazuki coming up next? Anywho, uh, you know, it's another debate for another day. Yeah, you know, if you're going to, you know, that there was a match here in this this last four or five that was going to get cut for time, and I totally agree with you. That's my only negative. I mean, I, I was a little worried, and we'll get into it when we're talking about I was a little worried that the next match was going to be cut for time, just based where it was put on the card when they did the uh, the opening announcements. So I was like, I, you know, I, as this match was getting going, I kind of figured this would be the one. I would have, again, rather this like 14, 15 minutes. And I think you even, your prediction was you thought this was going to go to a 15-minute time limit draw. Um, I thought this match, yeah, again, what you talked about before, you know, the deadlift power bomb, the German suit. You, she threw the Takayama Everest style German suplex uh, onto, onto Himika, which was super impressive. But I liked how the match, and I actually bumped it up a quarter of a star just really because of this. I liked how the match started with uh, Hashimoto going to the double leg and going right to the ankle lock. So the match started and ended with the same thing in a built. Like you would see whenever Himika would, would get up ahead of steam, like she went for the jumbo style knee. And I'm almost positive this has never happened to her just because of Himika being one of the, the uh, largest and strongest wrestlers in stardom. She goes for the jumbo knee uh, as she's building momentum to get the swing back in, you know, to, to her side, the momentum on her side. And Hashimoto catches her, it drops her down, and then puts her back into the ankle lock. I'm like, that's just super impressive. Yeah, it was hard hitting. Again, I would love to see another two or three minutes. I, again, I had it at three and three fourth stars but I bumped it up a quarter star uh, to a solid four stars just for the psychology because the beginning, the middle, the end, uh, basically the whole storytelling was Hashimoto going to that ankle lock. So uh, I thought the, uh, the psychology and the storytelling here and just the way the crowd psychology, again, another Imica pay-per-view match with full cheering. I think she did a great job taking full advantage and getting the people really, really behind her, uh, which then sets up you know Hashimoto's uh, next challenger. Absolutely. Post-match, Hashimoto takes the microphone, tells Himika that she can retire without any worry because she's proved how strong she is. Um, and then calls out Suri, and the worst-kept secret in uh, in stardom comes to pass um, with basically Jihiro uh, agreeing to face Suri at uh, the Yokohama Arena All-Star Grand Queendom in April. And... Uh, from what Chihiro Hashimoto has done, that great match with Marai, this good match with Himika, I feel like her and Suri, given the time, if they give that 15 minutes, even under 14, 13, 14, 15 minutes, that could be one hell of a brutal match. Not because of table spots and blood and stuff like that, but these two women could legitimately beat the hell out of each other and it's going to be compelling viewing map yeah absolutely absolutely now if you're keeping track at home and i even tweeted this out sherry cams in the ring for the first match that's one so <laughs> her and god her and god's eye are scouting uh which is smart you know you're you're with your teammates you want to scout who you're facing in the finals so suzuki calls them to the ring saying hey it's for the red belts that's two 
Hashimoto, the very next segment, wins this match, calls Shiri out, that's three, and you know that Shiri is coming to the ring for the main event, that's four. So if you're a fan of Shiri, which I believe we all are, you get your Shiri fix. I literally tweeted out, I said, I think Shiri's coming to the ring more times on this show than Bobby Heenan did at WrestleMania three. So uh, I feel like she's uh, <laughs> she been paid for appearance, do you reckon? Well, she is, but she, that, you know, she might retire by the end of the year. We don't want that to happen. She's, you know, rolling in the money. She made more money than Rasio Gawa did. At this <laughs> <laughs> what was your star rating? I'm just, uh, uh, um, just want to ask three to three quarters. Okay, so you're right close to me there. Yeah. Um, uh, next is the match I'm sure you're all here to listen to. Match 8, the Wonder of Stardom Championship match. Sayaka Matani, the champion, defeating Kazuki with the Star Crusher in 22 minutes and 48 seconds. Um, Matt, I'm just going to let you uh, just gonna let you go with this, brother. Okay. Uh, if you need to cut me off, cut me off because this is gonna be uh, this is gonna be an absolute love letter. And I, I I know Rob didn't watch this live. I watched this live, which just added added so much. And thanks to everybody that DM me during and right after this match because my phone was going off like crazy. Um, my only concern I just talked about about a moment ago was the fact that this it was this match you had this match and then you were having the high speed and then the red belt in the final. So I was like, wow, this is probably the lowest on the car that the white belt spends. So my only concern was this is going to go about eight or nine minutes. Um, and then maybe they'll do a proper rematch or whatever. That was my only concern. So obviously that was uh, taken away. So, uh, yeah, uh, like I said, I text Rob the next day and I was like, I'm going to have to talk about this somewhat on a long format. I don't want this to go too, too long, but I asked Rob if I can write an article just on this match for the, uh, the website. He said, of course, Rob, I will tell you, I will tell you something good, sir. There are two words you're not allowed to say in my house. And as it pertains to this match, there's one word you're not allowed to say to me. You're, I will absolutely snap on you. And that is the word fake. What I mean by that is you do not refer to professional wrestling to me as fake. It is so real. And what I mean by that, not only the bumps, the bruises, the time on the road, the time away from your family, the injuries... All that is real, but it was most real to me. Most, I don't know if that's a word. Most real to me, the realest to me, is the absolute passion and emotion that you can feel from a professional wrestling match. And I, I'm going to go, I'm not going to go by beat by beat, but I'll go by certain things. But I'll say this. There's points in this match that I was transformed. I, I felt it was 1997, 1998, when I first discovered, really discovered all Japan pro wrestling. And I've been on this podcast, or on this podcast, I've said several times before, that's my all-time favorite era of wrestling is the King Rhodes wrestling all Japan 90s. Just by the falsies and the constant building. Not only the falsies that you're doing with the wrestlers in the match, but the referee the crowd, the commentating. And I don't speak Japanese, but I know when people are going ballistic at the commentary booth. And the fact that you, Tommy and Lady C, were doing commentary on this and go back and watch when uh, when Saya kicks out of the Brain Buster and her fellow Queen's Quest mate, they're just going nuts, which leads me to say that anytime there's a big Queen's Quest match, uh, any Queen's Quest members that have already wrestled or not on the show, they need to do commentary because they just add to this match. Um, another part where I was transport to is, and I've said it on this show before, Saya Kamatani, when she's in these big matches and she's fighting from behind, it reminds me of Bret Hart in like 92, 93, 94, 95. In 1992, I was 10 years old. So I felt like I was, you know, once a teenager and I saw this mind-blowing All Japan stuff and I was transformed to sitting on my couch watching Bret Hart just getting his butt kicked and you see him making his comeback. And you forget that it's, and I'm not going to say the word, I'm not going to say the F word, uh, you forget that it's work because you want this person to rally behind. Now, going into this match, obviously I'm a huge fan of Sai Kamatani, I'm a huge fan of Suzuki. A lot of people ask me as a fan who I'm going for. I said, I don't know, I just want a really good match. So, start from the kind of the beginning. Suzuki comes out, new music. I like her old music better. Um, however, her new music is way better than Julia's new music. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> I'll say that. I'm a big fan of uh, of her old theme, but I'm like, okay, completely new gear, the new kimono, the whole night, she looked great, looked like a star. Again, I don't know, you said Hashimoto had the best entrance on this. I will respectfully disagree with you and say it was hands down Hazuki. Hazuki gets to the ring and every single member of stars is there to hold the ropes open for her. You had everybody there. All really you needed to add to this, Rob, was Arisa Hoshinki, 
Tam with her panda bear and Starlight Kid before she discovered clove cigarettes and My Chemical Romance or whatever, you know, because I mean, every member of Star, I'm like, that's a big deal because I don't think we've ever seen this before. Like even Mayu chat with the IWGP final with uh, Kyrie. I don't think we had every single member of Star. This is a big deal. Uh, and then you have the match, which was absolutely fantastic. And there's so many callbacks to their five-star match from last year and just the matches that these two have had in the multi-person tag matches over the last three or four weeks that have led to this match. Um, the match is builds, 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 builds. Um, again, Hazuki hits the brain buster, which he's beaten Sai Kamatani plenty of times with. And I don't think since hazuki has been back, I don't think anybody's kicked out of the brain buster like properly. So, uh, and if I'm wrong, please let me know, Rob. I mean, you're the smartest person to start. Am I wrong here? Is anybody kicked out of Hazuki's brain buster since she's been back? Um, oh, that's a very good question. The only thing, the only person I can think would have done is maybe Utami. Um, mm. when she went for the red belt, but no, none of them jump to mind. I don't think. No. So they do a great job. Again, this is very all Japan nineties where you build up your finishes. And if anybody's going to kick out, it's going to be at a major match. So Sai again, Sai kicks out and the crowd goes ballistic. The ref did an absolute perfect job on the, on the count. The commentating team is going nuts. Again, you're throwing Utami and lady C who, you know, in character are going to be biased towards Sai Kamatani. They're going nuts. So Hazuki fired up. She goes to lift. Saya Kamatani up for another brain buster. Saya throws her right leg out and squats down with her left leg. So this way, she, it's, it's dead weight. It's dead weight. She can't pick her up. Now, if you go back, and this is another great thing I loved about this match, is there's so many callbacks to the Saya Hazuki match, but a lot of callbacks to Saya Kamatani's uh, towards the end of her some of her white belt title matches. If you go back and watch the match she had with uh, Yumasaki at uh, Dream Queendom, where Yumasaki hits hits her with her finish, which I and I, forgive me if I'm wrong, I think it's the German suplex. Saya kicks out. Yumasaki gets all fired up. She runs off the ropes. Saya hits her with the Hurricanrana. Frankensteiner rolls her up. One, two, three. That's the way she gets the win. Once Suzuki realizes she can't get the second brain buster because Saya Kamatani smartly drops her weight down. She hits her with the hip attack. She goes off the ropes. Very similar to what Yumasaki did. Saya hits the Pritchard Perfect Frankensteiner. And I'm like, oh, what a finish this will be. But she kicks out and we start building it again. The place goes nuts. They go back and forth again. Star Crushers, some stiff shots back and forth. Hazuki starts kicking out. And then Hazuki catches Saya Kamatani in the Frankensteiner, her Karana. We talked about it a little bit before that she pinned her with the last time they were in the ring. And I did not, re- now Saya kicks out and I'm like, oh boy, what a way this would be. Saya kicks out and we start building again. I didn't realize this until the second time that I watched this match and it just added. Go back and watch it. When she hits the Hurricanrana, Hazuki, who's desperate at this point because she's already kicked out of the brain buster, has one leg hooked with her arm. You know where her other hand was, Rob? On Saya Kamatani's hair, which is illegal, pulling it down to get extra leverage on the pinfall, going back to her way to tie ropes. Only took a second and a half, but she's so desperate in this part. It'd be one thing if this happened before the brain buster, but the fact that this happened after the brain buster and she's desperate, she had to cheat just a little bit and still couldn't get the job done. Saya comes back. She decides she wants to become more stiffer than Hazuki. Makes sense. Um, hits it with the kick of Goye, the spin kicks, the whole nine. I mean, she's just firing up. And again, you can just feel, and again, the crowd going into this match, it was like 70 30 for Hazuki. As the match is going, it almost felt like Rocky Four. Hey, look, you know, I guess there was my Rocky reference from earlier in the show. It almost feels like Rocky Four, where the tide starts turning, and now it's like 60 40 for Saya. Saya hits the uh, Tornado Star Crusher, hits the regular Star Crusher, hits the 450 Splash, which I don't, again, let's. I don't think since Sai has been adopting the 450 as her main finisher since the Mina match, I'm almost positive. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rob. Nobody's kicked out of the 450, correct? I think Kyrie did. Did she? I think so, but oh, that I, that might be completely wrong, though. To be fair, I think she missed. I think she missed the 450. Kyrie went for the insane elbow, and Sai got the feet up. Anywho, anywho, so she hits the 450. And again, Hazuki, uh, Saya kicked out of the brain buster. 
Hazuki. So now we're back and forth. She kicks out of the 450 and we build again. Saya, very similar to what Hazuki was trying to do. It's like, I'm going to go to now my signature move. She hits the Star Crusher, not once, twice, and puts it away. This was absolutely brilliant. And I'm so glad I watched this match. I, 99% of these stardom pay-per-views I, I watch live, not unless I'm away at catch camp or something. And I'm so glad I watched this live for several reasons. One, my phone was absolutely blowing up with the DMs I was getting on Twitter and Instagram at 4.30, quarter to five in the morning when this match was happening. If I was asleep and I saw my phone going off that much, the dad in me would have had a heart attack because I would have thought something was wrong. Uh, two, it just showed that, well, I mean, there's so many more people that are watching stardom live as it happens all over the world. And I had so many people tell me exactly what I just said. They felt like they were 10 years old watching wrestling, you know, with their mom. Or I felt like I was five or six when I thought this was a hundred percent shoot. And I was at the edge of my couch watching, you know, whether it's Bret Hart or Shawn Michaels or Ric Flair or whoever. So I wasn't the only one that felt that way uh, in, in this match. This match was absolute perfection. This is, in my opinion, the best white belt match that Sai has had. This is the greatest Saya Kamatani match I've ever seen. This is the greatest Suzuki match I've ever seen. And this may possibly, and obviously, you know, we're going to discuss it when we get to the new tiers of the Patreon, which we're going to do a roundtable discussion. But I cannot wait for us to do our top five white belt matches because this may be my all-time favorite Wonder of Stardom Championship match. This was pretty damn near perfect. Um I feel like Hazuki's emotions and full disclosure, we are going to be talking a lot about Hazuki. Saya Kamatani played an absolutely fantastic part in this match and did everything she could to frustrate Hazuki and force her towards, as Matt mentioned, that Awaretai dark side. But Hazuki's emotions, her facials, her increasing despair as she realized that nothing she was doing was keeping Saya down. The moment she hits that first brain buster, you actually see her pump the air with a fist as though she thinks that this, this is it. I've won it, finally. She's 0-5 oh well, oh now. Um, she was 0-4 at the time, and the whole story of Hazuki has been this journey to the white belt and there's all that coming to a crescendo and we get one of the greatest kickouts i've ever seen one of the closest kickouts and it, i mentioned at the start of the podcast i was sitting having my lunch in costa coffee and uh i thought she'd done it i literally i didn't mean to punch the table i just had my fist underneath the table and i tried to get up and everything went everywhere but that's irrelevant um that's awesome <laughs> That emotion and then that look of utter despair on Hazuki's face as she goes to hit another one. And you can see as the match starts to slip away from Hazuki, the look of pure panic and almost resignation that she knows that this is the end, that she's failed again. And that level of just despondency that she has as she's carried from the ring by Kagame. Absolute perfection. Now, currently going around on Twitter is um, a video of Jey Uso turning on Sami Zayn. And, you know, it, it is good. And there have been people saying it's the best bit of wrestling acting in God knows how long. Um, and if that's your bag, absolutely fine. This, however was so subtle and was so perfect to the story that these two have built. I couldn't ask for any more. My only thing, my only thing here is that I wish Saya Kamatani had used the Phoenix Splash. When she kicks out of the 450, rather than just going to two star crushers, which, you know, it it's fine. The match is amazing. I'm I'm you know, spoiler, I gave it five stars. It's an incredible match. I just wish when she realized that she can't put Azuki away with the four fifty, she has to use the Phoenix Splash. She doesn't want to, she has to. And I feel like is that's that, is that saved for the Mina match though. But wouldn't that be a great way to go into the Mina match? 
you know, sort of that could be your way in. Oh, so you finally learned to use the Phoenix Splash properly, did you? Remember when you couldn't do it and you broke my teeth and my chin? It's a very, very small thing. I just felt like that was what we were building to. Now, my one thing, Matt, Sally Camatoni has been an outstanding white belt champion, and it's certainly up for debate that she has been the best white belt champion of all time. Here, and I text you with this, she is pretty much one of the most white meat baby faces in stardom. I text you saying I've never hated Saya Kamatani before. I can't believe you used that word. Oh, broke my heart. I was sitting in Target parking lot and I thought I had to call 911. So I, thought I, <laughs> I had to double check to make sure that was you. I was like, no, but I don't talk to anybody else about stardom. And I was like, I just saw I hate Saya Kamatani, Rob Goodwin. I was like, is this is this him? I almost I almost <laughs> passed out. I was like, what are you talking about? And then you explained, and I was like, I'm gonna have an explanation of what I think is gonna happen. But I'm sorry, so you finish your your thought. No, it's fine. Um, and it so felt like this was Hazuki's time. The crowd, you listen to the crowd, and the reaction to Saya is good. The reaction to Hazuki. I would argue, is the best on the entire show. She's the MVP of the show. I don't think anybody would disagree. Saya was great. This is one of the best time shows of all time. I don't think anybody would disagree with me. If you had to put one MVP on this show, is it's Suzuki. And I think she's causing stardom somewhat of a problem now. Because even post-match, she's been carried off and people are chanting Hazuki's name. I don't feel like you can just push her back down the card, especially now there is cheering. She has to be put. She's proved that she is one of the best on the roster. In ring, I'd argue she's top five, even top three. Ooh. In that, on that roster. Consistency, storytelling, just general resilience, fortitude, everything. She has it all. But what does she do now that she's lost? Because for me, I don't think she gets the red belt yet. I do Nobody think... does. I don't... Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's Julia's show. Yeah. Do I think she gets it eventually? Hell yes, I do. Because here, I think Hazuki has proved that she could be at the very, very top of this promotion. From I agree a thousand, thousand percent, brother. Because she can work both face and heel convincingly. She is over tremendously with the crowd. She has, to my knowledge, she hasn't had a bad match since she's been back. Her five star this year, last year, was incredible. She put on an absolute banger in like her third match back with Utami for the Red Belt, which I still recommend to people. And this match here is the best Sai has had of her entire run. And this run has had some fantastic matches in it. I just feel like you now have a decision to make because Azuki is, I believe, 25, maybe 26. Do you relegate her now to the undercard or do you push her? Because with Mina's challenge, which we have afterwards, Sai Kamatani, once hazuki has been taken out, she calls out Mina Shirakawa, gets a great reception, which is great, and they basically confirm that they are going to do this at Yokohama, which completely scuppers my Cinderella choice. <laughs> but we'll get into that, it's fine. Um, but where does Hazuki go from here? That's, that's what I'm wondering. So what do you I think? I think it's... I think this is clear as day. I think, and again, like I said before, they have 10 options, nine and a half of them are the right ones. But I think this one, it, what I'm about to say is the, uh, is the best one. Um, you talked about Hazuki working baby face or heel. I don't think Hazuki needs to go back to heel. I think she needs to stay exactly where she's at. Do you push her? Hell yes. Now, before this match was announced, I had Hazuki winning the Cinderella because I thought this was the match we were going to see at Yokohama. And can you imagine if you were to copy and paste it, this match in front of, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 people at Yokohama in, in the most watched starting show of all time. Um, once this, this Suzuki match was announced, I leaned towards Tam winning the uh, Cinderella to heat her up going into her match with Julia. Obviously, we'll get into that. 
they don't need the Cinderella for that, apparently. Um, so you had Mina. That was your idea because Mina's going to win the Cinderella, and then it's going to be Mina challenging Daya uh, at Yokohama. You were half right, sir, but uh, I obviously don't see Mina winning the Cinderella now because of this. So now it's like it, it wrench is thrown and everybody's kind of picked because I think everybody thought whoever wins the Cinderella would get a massive title match at Yokohama. Um, I had some people did say, and I'm going to get to your answer and uh, 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 que- uh, your question, uh, answer your question, excuse me in a second. I did have some people say, well, that's maybe how Mayu gets the IWGP chance. May- uh, maybe she wins the Cinderella. And it's like, well, my- does Mayu need to win the Cinderella three times? At the same time, it's Mayu winning. No one will ever question it. She can literally come out tomorrow with the uh, future stardom championship and say she won it in a Kobe beef uh, eat off. Like it's Mayu. We'll take it as it is. But uh, anywho, so my I'm going to go back. I think this is, this is what's going to happen. Suzuki is going to win the Cinderella tournament. I think Saya retains against Mina, and and I'm not sure on that one. I'm so and I I'll have a better idea in the next month to see how the buildup is because I know there's a lot of people I talk to that 90 percent of them think that Mina's taking the belt, and that would not be a bad choice at all. But I believe two or three weeks ago, Rob, you did tell me there's a big show. I think in May or June in Fukuoka. Fukuoka, Fukuoka, where Hazuki's from, correct? Uh, yeah, Fukuoka Goddess uh, something. Fukuoka Goddess Legend. Look at you, Goddess something. Um, and I think that's where you do the title change. And I think it has to be against Saya. Because you really didn't have, we were saying you kind of almost shotgunning Hazuki here. They did a good job building her up because she just kept pinning uh, Saya in these multi-person matches leading up to it. But now you, and, and Sarum does this great. We, we talked about it uh and they've been doing it for years, how they get somebody so close to the top of the mountain, they get knocked down, and they do a great job building it up. We saw it in the EOV 14 where eventually Mayu knocked her off the mountain. We saw it with Sherry uh, where she got so close with Utami. We even saw it with Julia. I mean, even Julia this time last year, she was challenging Sherry for the uh, the World of Stardom Championship at, at World Climax, and uh, she lost, and she had to build herself back up in the five-star, and look where she is now. Um, obviously, you're telling the same story at Mina because she was so close in getting that win over Saya back at the end of the year. So you're you're telling the same story there. But I think right now, I think if you're looking at this, like I think Hazuki's the bigger star. And not only that, but you're going to have to be the one to follow the one. Uh, is Mina a great choice? Yes, she's fantastic. But I think Hazuki is the better choice. So my prediction, uh, I'm not locking it in until we... Uh, we do our actual bracketology, uh, which will be an absolute mess uh, coming up in a few weeks. Is Hazuki wins the five star? Uh, Sire retains at um, a Yokohama Double Super Duper Looper with sprinkles on top. Dream Cinderella, and then at the uh, the show in Hazuki's own hometown, in her hometown, in the main event. And I said it before: once Sire drops this belt, I just want it to be in the main event because it needs to mean it's going to mean that much in the main event. Hazuki wins the uh world or the the wonder of stardom championship after you heated her back up by winning the uh the cinderella i think that's where you need to go with this to me that's as clear as day i think that's as clear as day i think that's the easiest plan there's so many people that love this match but they thought that hazuki should won i think it's going to mean more for them to build her back up and the proper way to do it is again winning the cinderella tournament she has a big win at uh yokohama you have her keep winning matches, and then she beats Saya at that show in May. My only issue with that is, and I am aware that we've been going for two hours and we've still got three matches to do. Um, my only issue with that is, I think, yeah, Hazuki is certainly one of your four front runners now to win the Cinderella, especially now you've realized just how over she is, as you know, in case you didn't already know you risk burying Mina. If she doesn't beat Saya here, where she's already taken on Saya once, lost. She's got the story now with Saya. If she loses, where does she go now? She's already gone for the white belt three times in the space of, what, just over a year? And she's she'll have lost to Saya twice. Does she necessarily does she get the rub from the loss there because I'm not sure she does. I don't think she gets the rub from winning the bell against Saya and then losing it a week later to Hazuki in uh, in Fukuoka, but I don't think that'll happen. I don't think they'll hot shot the bell. They don't seem to do that. Although, we haven't had a transitional Y belt champion in a while. Hmm. 
a week might be a bit harsh. So, um, I don't know. I, I'm i sceptical. I mean, we're assuming, obviously, I mean, it does make sense for Hazuki to be in a prominent match in uh, in Fukuoka, our hometown, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, either way, what an incredible match. What an emotional roller coaster we were on in that match. Those two women created absolute magic together. There's very, very few times I will give out five stars and not worry about it or not be like, mm, maybe I've been too generous. Maybe it, no, five stars. Absolutely 100% match of the year so far for me i know we're only in march so there's not a lot to go on but you know absolutely incredible absolutely incredible yep uh, before we move on uh i you know we've been on this a long time um five and a quarter this broke it for me <gasps> oh my god matt broke the scale i've only done i think there's uh, the, the the final two eo versus mayu red belt matches the julia sherry match and uh the uh, thunder rock versus mako and Kyrie match again i have this at five stars but just with all the tweets and the way that this match made me feel made me feel like i was 10 years old made me feel like a teenager again the fact that not only was i feeling that but i was getting tweets and dms that there was at least four or five other people that were feeling that same way i i, I had to bump it up sorry not sorry i had to bump it up <laughs> Um, let's move on then. High speed championship match. I mean, I, I initially I was like, how the hell do you follow that match? Um, turns out with a really, really, really good high speed match between Azumi and Starlight Kid, with Azumi submitting Starlight Kid with a Numero Uno in 17 minutes and five seconds. Sometimes two people just gel, and sometimes two people can just create a wonderful narrative in what they're doing. An Azumi and Starlight Kid could wrestle for the rest of time and I would never get bored of watching it. This match was another fantastic chapter and a closing chapter, it seems, in their high-speed feud. And there were so many little callbacks to that phenomenal match in February last year from uh, Cinderella Journey in Nagaoka. There were so many. But this in itself was its own little match. It had its own moments, and it was so different as well from the Cinderella Journey match because whereas that match in 2022, it had those high spots, those incredible feats of athleticism that we know these two are capable of, whereas this, I feel, was far more rooted in wrestling than that match. It was almost like they were auditioning to show, yeah, we're not just high-speed wrestlers we can also do this. There was high-speed moments. There was athletic moments. Azumi doing her incredible dive over the top of the rope, the cross body, and things like that. But similarly, we had brand new things to bring out. Like, I will never not flinch when Azumi does the... Um... Oh, what's it called? <laughs> My mind's gone blank. The Canadian, the, the no, Canadian the, Destroyer? No. The, the, double, the double arm? Uh the thing the from the top, rope, the top rope into the arm rope, into the arm bar. What's it called? The miss the uh, mystica. The mystica. Mystica. Yeah. Uh, There's a lot of things that she does that you're like, how does she do that? <laughs> yeah, but the way the starlight kid just falls, it it never makes me. It it always makes me flinch. But I feel like these two were almost like I said before, showing that you know what? Yes, we were synonymous with this high speed championship division, and this is why. However. We're ready to move on to bigger things. No offense to the high speed championship, but to bigger things, to the white belt, to the red belt, to the point where we even had the signif the significance of Starlight Kid even bowing to the belt and rolling from the ring. I think this was better than their match in Nagawoka, and I loved that match. I think this pips it simply because they were able to weave that subtle narrative into this story whilst not compromising that high speed style. These two cannot put on a bad match. They could have a blindfold beauty salon match and it's oh still goodness. be excellent. Take my, take my money. <laughs> <laughs> and it would still be excellent. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. They filled Honestly, they filled unenviable shoes um, in trying to follow that Hazuki and Sayaka Matani match, but I think they did it with a plum. 
four and a half stars. Excellent, excellent match. Azumi's offense, especially the fact that uh, I, I went and watched all their singles matches for uh, the Patreon. And if you haven't got a chance yet, please go back and watch uh, watch the review. And Rob and I actually did a, uh, a match from uh, th- um, uh, about two and a half years ago from Azumi and Starlight Kid. But Azumi's matches, obviously, she's trying to go for the numero uno. So she's working on the arm. And Starlight Kid's main weapon in her offense is her legs because of her speed. And there's a spot early in this match where Azumi has wrist control of uh, Starlight Kid. She, she kicks out Starlight Kid's leg to start the leg work. And Starlight Kid almost like takes like a knee bump. But then Azumi stays on wrist control and then kicks out uh, Starlight Kid's arm. So all with like in one motion, she's trying to take out Starlight Kid's main offense and then build her offense. I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen that before. And there's so many little things when I watch an Azumi match. For someone who's only 20, 21 years old, I'm like, that's brilliant. I've never seen that before. Oh, my God, that's great. The way that she builds things and does these little things to build towards their match, it's absolutely brilliant. And Azumi, who's probably had about four or five different gear changes, and I mean like ring gear, in the last year, did you notice she was wearing the same exact ring gear she wore for their match last year? I did indeed. Another fantastic callback. And, uh, brother, you already answered the question. Again, we're oceans away. I had one question for you. What match did you like better, this match or the match from last year? And the answer is there's really no wrong answer. But I agree with you. I slightly, slightly like this match better than the one last year. The match last year had more moves. like, And not that they didn't do cool moves here. But this match had a better story. And not that the uh, match last year did not have a good story. I think it was just had a slightly better better story on this one not only that but this match had a follow-up one of the greatest startup matches of all time <laughs> and they naturally knocked it out of the park and the crowd was really into it because i was like almost exhausted i was like exhausted again writing everything i was writing the emotion i was feeling and you know mess and thank you everybody that sent me messages at 4 30 quarter to 5 in the morning that's added to the match and then after i get done writing i go get a drink of water and i look up I'm like oh yes this is next <laughs> i was like where am i go? where's my energy on this one um but yeah, this was uh, this was absolutely fantastic, and uh, I don't. It's, it's supposedly the last high speed match for now, but I can see the two of them, even if neither of them are high speed champion. If like maybe a year or two down the road, like Azumi versus Starlight Kid in a high speed style match, just to be like, ooh, oh, we're gonna see. Even though it's not for the belt, you know, it's gonna be a high speed style match. So uh, yeah, this was uh, absolutely fantastic. I like this one a little bit better than you, buddy four and three fourth stars but i mean literally i mean you want to talk about back to back not only back to back matches but like back to back to back to back to back like these last five or six matches just truly stunning just truly stunning but uh yeah i thought it was uh tremendous like you said these two cannot put on a bad match even if they did have the blindfold beauty zest salon (laughs) salon match which that i tell you one thing i we about an hour and a half ago we said i i don't think i'd ever pay 40 dollars for a stardom and showcase pay-per-view if you put that match on i'm paying the 40 dollars <laughs> um let's move on then to the world of stardom championship match which was not the main event with julia and maya yukihi ending in a double count out in 17 minutes and 57 seconds now uh, I don't think me and Matt truly sort of appreciated or understood the uh, the history between Julia and Maya. And Monthly Pure S, who actually put out an interview they did with Julia that uh, I'm just going to read a little bit of it to you now. Um, Despite Yukihi being a senior to Julia in Ice Ribbon, she explicitly stated she has no respect towards the former Ice Infinity champion, let alone looking up to her. They have had three matches and Julia has lost all three times. The new Dangerous Queen alleges that Yukihi constantly talked about her behind her back, adding that she spent her entire time in Ice Ribbon knowing about it and resenting her for it. They then had a very heated confrontation at the press conference. So a lot of this is rooted in whether it's worked or whether it's shoot in a tangible hatred for each other and you know I, I spoke earlier about the ridiculousness of the finish of the hardcore match I think a double count out here actually works perfectly for the story these two are trying to tell ultimately Mayuki wasn't bothered about the red belt 
She was more bothered about hurting Julia. And ultimately, she's actually come out and said, I don't think winning the World of Storm Championship is the apex of women's wrestling, to be perfectly honest. She's so blasé about that championship. All she wants to do is hurt this woman she hates. And what better way to show that than with a Northern Lights bomb on the floor and stopping someone getting back in the ring. I just, I think, despite the what many people will think is a janky finish, I really, really liked it. I liked the violence they managed to portray during this match. I enjoyed all the horrible spots that Alpha mentioned Northern Lights bomb on the floor. That flat bump that Mayuki takes on the ramp at the top. Jesus Christ. The two table spots, which we saw Julia getting her uh, her standard pile driver through the table spot. Nothing seemed forced and contrived. Everything seemed earned and made sense in this big overarching emotional war that these two were putting on together. Was it your typical red belt defense? No. But is that a bad thing? No. I think the finish worked. I think the story they told worked. I think my Yukihi looked great, considering she's not someone you would find in a stardom main event ordinarily. I think she's done wonders, pardon the pun, um, throughout her run in this uh, triangle derby going up to this match. And I think this is a yet another different challenge for julia i do like the fact that the two challenges she's had so far are sort of skeletons from her ice ribbon closet love that i think it's a great little story to tell these ghosts of her past coming to try and ruin her present love that think it's great and overall though it probably wasn't as sort of visually pleasing as the um azumi and starlight kid match perhaps not as emotionally compelling as the hazuki and starlight um, and sayaka matani match I think this had its own part to play in this card, and I loved it. Four and a quarter stars. Really enjoyed it, Matt. There's a reason why I double count. There's several different reasons why I double count out works here. One, it's not the uh, the main event. Two, are you really going to complain about a finish when they give us that this good of a match? Three, we just had back-to-back match of the year candidates. Arguably the greatest white belt match of all time. Arguably the greatest high-speed championship match of all time. You kind of going into this, it's a little bit different. And I knew, like, okay, like, okay, now I'm got to watch this match. Like, I'm mentally exhausted in the best way possible because I just watched, again, two great matches. But you know, this is going to be a little bit more stiffer because of the, uh, the storyline going into it. So it's like you had this great match. You've been giving me all great wrestling. I know I have one more match that's on after this. So that's why the double count out uh, works. And, you know, and, uh, there was, from what I understand, there in Jerry Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett, but in Jerry Jarrett's office in Memphis, he had a big sign that says "Personal Issues Draw Money." So when they replay this match back, and I'm assuming it's to be the main event, probably of a pay per view, we're gonna tune in because we're gonna have a finality of this match. It's probably where Julia gets her decisive win. Not only that, but one thing I love that a lot of this match again, you just talked about it, is is based on their personal history, and a lot of it has my uh, Maya disrespecting not only Julia, but the world of stardom championships, saying it's not the apex of women's wrestling, where Julia's been chasing that belt for the last year and a half, literally almost killing herself and her best friend, Cherry. Uh, go back and watch the match they had in December to get that belt. I mean, literally, I mean, this is not only the most important belt to Julia, this is Julia's life. And the bell doesn't even ring, and how does it start in the best way possible? Where Julia takes the red belt, that means the world tour, and it's like, you don't think this belt's important? And blasts Mayu right in the face and then hits you with the backdrop driver right in front of Yas- y- Yoshi Oga- or, uh, Rossi Ogawa. And then the match starts. So I was like, oh, geez, that's how we're starting. I'm like, that makes perfect sense. Every promo, every little thing leading up to this match about her disrespecting the white belt was like, yeah, you don't like are the red belt. You don't like the red belt. Here it is right over your head before the bell even rings. I'm like, They built up all these promos just for that one spot to open this match. And I thought it was brilliant. It was a wild brawl. Uh, These are the type of Julia championship matches that we're going to get. One, I'm a little concerned because she's wrestling like a Kira Hokuto and like 93, 94. I just hope her body holds up. Um, But two, I mean, we're going to be in for another phenomenal world of stardom uh, uh, reign. And I'm so excited for them to run this match back. Yeah, I mean, you see the... Julia did the pile driver through the table. She took the crazy tiger driver style uh, through the uh, through the table from uh, from Maya. And then when Julia got up, her back was all scarred up. I mean, there was just some crazy stiff shots between the two of them back and forth. 
Um, yeah, the double count out here. I yeah, there was a point where the ref kept getting like shoved on the outside, and I and I, I I'm very big on rules in wrestling, and I'm like, okay, I can kind of see. I think it was Daichi. I think he was the ref. I can kind of see him let it go because this is it's for the it's for the red belt. Mm. I can kind of see letting him go, and then when he got shoved like the second or third time, I was like, maybe this is leading up to somewhere, but I'm not liking this. And then when they had the double count out, maybe it might have made sense. Maybe if they did a double disqualification, but you know, regardless, I'm like, okay, I understand. It's like, all right, enough's enough. They're getting counted out. That's it. That I can only bend the rules so much. I have to rules that I have to enforce. I, I can only slow the count so much. So. Yeah, it made sense uh, for them to follow up two great matches the way they did. Kudos to Stardom. Kudos to Julia. Kudos to Mayuguki. Uh, I just had four and a half stars. Absolutely loved it, and I cannot wait for the blow-off of this match because uh, assu- I'm assuming it's probably going to be coming somewhere towards the end of spring, beginning of summer. And I think what you do is you have Julia go over her, obviously pretty significant, and then we don't hear from Maya uh for a month obviously she'll she'll do her ice ribbons and uh, oz academy and everything she does and then when you do the announcement for the five star you just like oh yeah by the way my Guki, who had these phenomenal matches with julia she's coming back in the five star and i think that's how you bring her back in makes sense i mean you're not gonna have your champion be oh three and one against the challenger are you she needs that definitive win so it's going to be interesting to see where they go um and we get what we knew was going to be our next Red Belt Challenge. It's the next installment of the Tam and Julia saga. Tam comes out, challenges Julia for the Red Belt, says she's desperate for it. She's willing to put anything on the line, her hair, her money, her name, which was a weird one. Um, She says, you know, even become your slave. Um, Again, these translations are coming courtesy of Karen Pearson. And Julia just basically goes, no, 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 it's fine The the red belt will be enough. Just just chill your beans, Tam. So, um, yes, we are getting the next installment, the next chapter in that storied rivalry at Yokohama Arena. So something else to look forward to on what is already shaping up to be an outstanding card. And finally, two hours and 14 minutes into this podcast, we get to the main event, the Triangle Derby 1 final. The prominent team, the champions, the artist of Storm champions, defend their belts and win the Triangle Derby, defeating the Abarembo God's Eye team with Suzu Suzuki pinning Mirai with 13 seconds left at 14.47 um, with the German suplex. Um, uh, Matt, were you surprised that Prominence won? Um, were you surprised with the match? What did you think overall of this match? First of all, I thought this was a great way to uh, shine up the artist belts. When you have this as your main event over all three of your other big singles belts uh, and all three great matches, I thought that this was a really good way to get the tournament over, get your champions over, and get your belts over, which is a no- one of the many, many reasons why I love stardom is they do a great job getting their championships over. It doesn't matter if it's the red belt to the future belt. They do a great job. Uh, Rob, as far as me, I had to watch this match back, and here's the reason why. Uh, there was an episode of The Simpsons many, many moons ago where Homer wakes up in the middle of the night and he starts eating, eating single slices of cheese. And then the next scene they show is it's early in the morning and Marge comes downstairs and she sees Homer with all these empty wrappers of cheese. And she goes, Homer, did you eat all the cheese? And he goes, I think I've gone blind. So this match <laughs> happened and then all of a sudden it finished. And I was like, oh, I don't think this was good at all. I thought it was really short. And then and everybody's tweeting me like this might was one of the top three best matches of the uh, of the tournament this or that it went almost 15 minutes and i was like i think i saw so much good wrestling that i went blind and then i went to the gym took a nap and then i went back i'm like this match was great i don't remember it being this good because again <laughs> i think i went blind uh, i thought it was i i was stunned by the finish i thought for paper for a show this good um, I thought it would have ended with Sherry holding up one of the artists of stardom belts. You have Sherry, who's the Wrestling Observer, Women's Wrestler of the Year, number one, PWI, blah, 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 blah. You know, now that finally Mariah gets her, gets a singles title, I thought that would be the way to go. Um, and then when it came down to Mariah versus Suzu Suzuki, again, you see the way that they build their uh, six-person matches. I'm like, oh, this is going to be – this. I thought we would have had either Suzu – and Sherry are Sherry and Haragi. I thought it would have been uh, uh, Sherry getting the final fall. I'm like, oh, they're going to put Mariah over here. And then she kicks out of the, she gets, eats the tequila shot. 
And then she eats the two German suplexes. And I was like, oh, okay. I did not see that finish coming, but I talked about it last week when we didn't think Prominence had a shot at winning this tournament. But I'm like, well, if they do, it makes sense because they're the champions going in. Why wouldn't they be the best? And this just puts more shine on them and more shine on the titles. A uh, really good way to end the tournament. A really good way to uh, to end this phenomenal, phenomenal show. Uh, I had it at uh, four and a quarter. Yeah, I had it at four stars. Um, honestly, I thought this was probably one of the matches of the tournament, if not top three matches of the tournament. Um, I thought everyone looked great. Um, and even the fact that the team that I picked to win lost in the final didn't really uh, didn't really bother me that much. Um, overall, I think it was a great match. My next question, Matt, I gave it four stars, as I mentioned. Obviously, prominence, the first holders of this tournament. Obviously, Matt, we were going to do our top three matches, our top three teams, our top three singles competitors. But as the podcast ticks towards two and a half hours, I think maybe we should leave that for next week when we haven't got as much to talk about. You got it, buddy. Um, One question. Do you... A, do you think we do a Triangle Derby 2? I imagine we probably do. What would you change going forward in this tournament, if anything? Two things. I would have the uh, red block wrestle the red block and the blue block wrestle the blue block because we didn't know that was happening until like the day before. And I text you and I'm like, do we miss this? And you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, yeah, that's what's happening. Um, and I would probably put more of the actual six persons team on it. Like the fact, like I know that the Uedo Tai team of Saki, of Momo Watanabe and Starlight Kid who had a phenomenal run with the artist belts. They just lost the belts and then they broke them up in the tournament. Obviously, I would keep like the prominence. You definitely keep Queen's Quest. Damn right you do. Uh, keep those, keep the members of, you know, Zumi, Saya, and Yutami. Um, I would obviously change. I would have uh, uh, Saya, Yutami, and the Zumi not only win the tournament, but beat everybody. Just have them go undefeated. Like, let's not joke around here. Um, but no, and I'll honestly, uh, I, those are the two things I would change. I would just have. The wrestlers in the red block, wrestlers the red in the red block, and the blue in the blue, and then I would kind of have more established six person uh, teams because I mean a lot of these teams, probably more than half, are kind of almost like makeshift. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you were going stars is a team, it's Mayu, Kogama, and Hazuki. So you know that team is very exciting. You'd go Julia, Himika, Micah. The only problem you've got then is you are sort of leaving. I don't want to necessarily be disparaging and say you're B plus players. Here I am talking like Vince McMahon. Um, but, you know, if you top loads, you're always going to have sort of matches that don't really matter at the bottom, which I think is a shame. I do see why they do it, obviously, because if, you know, someone needs to eat the pinfall. Um, my one thing is this, this tournament seems to have gone on forever. And whereas. The five star goes on for a relatively long time. I think it started the 31st of July, ended the 1st of October. But you got matches and you'd say, right, well, Mayu versus Starlight Kid, um, Shuri versus Risa Sarah, Hazuki versus bloody everyone, Mirai, you know, having absolute bangers, you know, against Mayu, for example, in that fantastic match early on in the tournament. Mina in the last bit having that fantastic run, her match with Amisori at Corrigan Hall. That was last year. If you asked me to give you a top five matches from this tournament, I'm not entirely sure I could give you five matches from this tournament simply because it's gone on that long or it feels like it hasn't. I don't know whether that's just because we've had like one match on a show rather than having dedicated shows or what it is, but they need to shorten it, whether it's make it one block as opposed to two or whether it's I've seen someone on Twitter say make it a single elimination block I mean that could work as well doesn't have to be a two block round robin I just feel like there was there was too much and it went on slightly too long is that no I, I see your point. Even until about an hour before we were podcasting, I was doing my, I knew how my top three performances are and my top three teams. 
and I had an idea of top matches. And even my number one match, I was like, I'm almost positive I saw this match five or six weeks ago. And it's a good thing I write everything down because I have my 2023 notebook and I had to shuffle through it. And I'm like, there it is. I'm like, yep, that's the match I had the highest rating. Like, I wasn't even sure that that, I'm like, I think this is number one, but did, did that, ha- did, did I imagine it? And obviously we'll, you know, we'll talk, we'll leave you on the hook. There's the hook folks for you to come back next week as we'll give you our top three matches, individual performance in our top three teams. But I was like, I, I think this is my number one. I'm like, hold on one sec. And I had to go back through some pages in my notebook. I'm like, oh, there it is. But no, yeah, you're right. I forgot that that match happened just because it kind of went on a little bit too long and nothing, not like the five star where it's like, I can, I can tell you one of the best matches of the five star was Hazuki versus Julian. That was night one. One of exactly. the best matches of the five star was Mayu versus Mirai. That was night one. I remember things like that where this was just like, again, maybe we're spoiled. I talked, I talked about it. There was nothing that was bad about this. Everything was good to very good with a couple things hitting great. Maybe we're just spoiled for how good Starvin's been the last two or three years. But uh, yeah, I see your point. Maybe shorten up a little bit. If you're not going to do a single elimination, maybe double elimination. Once you lose two, you're out. That's a possibility. Rossi Ogawa text Rob Goodwin. He's here to help you help you out. <laughs> um, now, Matt, would you like to uh, tell the good people at home who the next challenges are to prominence's artist of stardom belts? I sure do. And wait, I thought we would get the challenge in the ring. I'm glad we didn't because you got the nice, you know, big trophy presentation with the confetti going off and the giant quilt thing that looked like my grandmother made for us. It was great. <laughs> so they go backstage and I'm kind of just getting thinking, I'm like, all right, let me take my I'm gonna take my nap a little bit. Let me see what's going on backstage. And we get the next challengers, folks, bow down to the queens as if this damn promotion can't get any better. As if Sayakamatani and Azumi didn't do enough on this show, they come backstage as Prominence is cutting their backstage interview, and we're going to see Prominence defending the Artists of Stardom champions uh, uh, against the real winners, in my opinion, of the Triangle Derby. Uh, Azumi, Star- uh, yeah, Starlight Kid. Azumi, Sayakamatani. <laughs> imagine, that, imagine that team. Holy jeez. Azumi, Sayakamatani, and Yutami Hayashista. Don't know when that is going to happen. But uh, yes, I will be literally taking my wallet and throwing it at the TV. Take my money. I love the fact that you're so excited about that, that you forgot how to talk. That that <laughs> makes me very, very happy. Um... <laughs> I've, I've been singing Saya Kamatani's praises raises for the last hour and i forgot that she was a, she was a member of queen's <laughs> quest i replaced her with starlight kid <laughs> um yeah and it's going to be an incredible match at the moment i believe that the time and the place is still up for debate it's not going to be a yokohama obviously because um Taikamatani is going to be in the white belt match with mina so i imagine it will be on one of the shows leading up to that we've still got a lot of time before uh, yokohama um but that is the end of our reviews i just want to quickly go through the next show in the next podcast we'll go through the shows that are going to be taking place back to back to back on the 10th the 11th and the 12th of march uh, the 10th of march is going to be from Corican Hall um, and that card is as follows um, we open with a future of stardom number one contendership three way battle Rina, Miyu Amasaki and Hina uh, we've got a three way tag team match with Rebel and Enemy, Ram Kai Chow uh, Mayu Ozaki Mayu Ozaki? Mike Ozaki taking on Fukin Death, Saki Kashima and uh, Momokogo and Kogame. We've then got a tag team match which looks very very nice. Suri and Mirai versus Momo Watanabe and Starlight Kid. Yes please um, Oh yeah Eight woman tag, stars team of Mayu, Hazuki uh, Sayurida and Hanan taking on the Donna Del Mondo team of Julia, Micah, Tekla, and May Sakurai. Six woman tag. Um, we have got Cosmic Angels, um, uh, Tam Nakano, Mina Shirakawa, and Mariah May taking on Queen's Quest. Bow down to the Queens indeed. Yutami Hayashista, Sayakamatani, and Azumi. Um, we have then got a future of stardom championship match. Amisori, the champion, defending in a third title defense against Lady C. Um, we have then got in the semi main again, these are all subjects change, the order might change. Uh, we have got the Himika retirement road continuing with a singles match Himika versus Natsupoi. Obviously, those two were incredibly close during their time in Donna Del Mondo. And then finally, our main event, the Goddesses of Stardom Championships match seven up versus 
BMI, which is going to be forearms and slams all over the place. And I'm all here for it, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. That card looks really good. Obviously, I'm assuming they're going to be heating up Queen's Quest going into their uh, championship match, but it'll be great to see um, the uh, the that team versus our Queen's Quest versus uh, you know Mina, Mariah May, and uh, who was the is it who was the third person? Was it Waka? And uh, no, Tom. Oh, t- oh, geez. Oh, wow. Yeah. Again, I, I I'm so excited and so love this stuff so much that I forgot Tam was in a match with Queen's Quest. Oh boy, I might need a beer. <laughs> Oh, Wacker's not on this card. <sighs> Is she on the next ones? Hang on. So that was the 10th. The 11th, we have got... We open with a three-way battle. So this is um, from... Hachi Oji. Yeah, exactly. Hachi Oji. I think I've said that right. Um, so... No, she's not on this card either, I don't think. So we open with a three-way battle, Ramkai, Chow, Yuna Mizumori, and Lady C. We've then got a six-woman tag team match, Juliet, Tekla, and Mei Sakurai taking on Kogamet, Hanan, and Momo Kogo. Tag team match, Mina Shirakawa and Mariah May taking on Rina and Ruaka. Six-woman tag, the stars team of Mayu Iwatani, Hazuki, and Saeeda taking on Shiori, Mirai and Amisori. That sounds very, very good. Uh, and we've then got a 10 woman tag, Queen's Quest versus Oeratai. And then in the main event, My Himi versus Meltier. Oh, wow. Wow. Rob, I just remembered that on the press conference for New Blood, once Kyrie was announced as the uh, one of the opponents, that uh, Waka did say she's going to be spending time resting and preparing for this match. Maybe that's the reason why she's not on these shows. It would make sense, wouldn't it? It would make sense. Yes. Um, and then finally, the the card from the twelfth, which is from Toki. Uh, we have got Momo Koga versus Yuna Mori in a singles match. Mirai versus Miyu Amasaki in a singles match. Uh, Wing Gori taking on Club Venus. Um, a three-way tag match, BMI 2000 taking on Meltier and Suri and Amisori. Uh, we have then got an eight-woman tag. We have got the Queen's Quest team of Utami, Sayakamatani, Azumi, and Lady C taking on Julia, um, Micah, Himika, and May Sakurai. And then in our main event, we have got the stars team of Mayu Iwatani, Hazuki, and Kagame taking on the Oeritai team of Starlight Kid, Momo Watanabe, and Saki Kashima. So lots and lots of matches to look forward to on these shows. I'm very much looking forward to the Karakuen Hall show. Just very quickly, Matt, do you think we see the future of Stardom Belt change hands, yes or no? And I'm going to say no. I think that eventually it's going to go to Rena. I think Rena's going to be the next holder of that belt sometime soon. Completely agree with you. And do you see BMI 2000 capturing the um, Goddess of Storm Championships from 7-Up? No, sir. Nope, neither do I. So there we go. <laughs> but overall, I'm really, really, really excited for this card. It looks really, really stacked. We've got some interesting tag team matches. We've got some great tags coming up on that uh, 11th of March show. Don't forget Melty versus My Himmy in the main event. That's going to be very, very tasty. So next week, guys, we'll bring you those three shows. Hopefully, if they're all uploaded, um, definitely the 10th and the 11th i would have thought we might struggle with the 12th if it's not uploaded if it's not we'll simply move it to the next week but with that being said ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for bearing with us as we wax lyrical about what was an absolutely outstanding pay-per-view really 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 go and check it out because it was in my opinion one of the greatest that stardom have ever put on cage match currently has it as the fifth best stardom show to ever have happened for so take that for what you will but thank you for listening guys we really do appreciate it you can check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts if you think we've earned it a five-star review on apple podcasts goes a hell of a long way to helping out the podcast we massively appreciate it don't forget to check out our patreon patreon.com forward slash the stardom cast we are going to be renovating that 
Patreon at the start of May. We've got so many good things coming your way. We can't wait to share them with you. Um, you can find us on social media at The Stardom Cast. Don't forget to check out the website, www.thestardomcast.com. Um, if you want to talk to me, you can find me at, at Real Rob Goodwin. Matt, where can they find you? And then sign us off, dear friend. You can find me on the internet, uh, Twitter and or Instagram, Matt Turner OF. Uh, any questions, comments, send me some uh, you know DMs. I've actually had a lot of people ask me for some match opinions. So uh, we have some new listeners to the show. So welcome. I hope you enjoyed and uh, hope that you hung out with us as long as the show went. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, if social media is not your thing, you can drop me an email. The Stardomcast22 at gmail.com is the best way to get a hold of me. Read the email. Once again, folks, thanks for hanging out with us as long as we did. I, we hope that you enjoyed it as much as Rob and I had uh, such a great time giving this uh, show to you and talking about these. Uh, well, one really, really, really good show and one kind of fun show. Uh, regardless, thanks again so much for the support. Anything that we can do, just let us know. Because like I always say, folks, it's just not my podcast. It's our podcast because we're all together and everybody's different. Everybody's special.